Welcome everyone to episode number 50. Can you believe it's the big five Oh, um, I, I can't believe we're here. And I was just thinking the other day how episode 50, I got to do something special. So I decided to shoot my shot as the kids say, and <laughs> try to reach out to someone who I have been watching on YouTube for quite a while now. And I have learned a lot from, and has some of my very favorite speculative fiction videos here on YouTube. And that is the great and powerful Dr. Gregory B. Sadler. How are you? I'm good. You might be talking me up a little bit too much for your audience. <laughs> well, I've been mentioning you in my videos and on streams for the last three years that I've had this oh, channel nice. because I have uh, I've learned a lot from you and uh, you're, you're just such a uh, good communicator and a brilliant guy. And uh, for those who aren't kind of aware of you and everything you do, because you do a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Uh, why don't you give them a little rundown of who you are? Sure. So. Uh, I'm a guy here from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who started out, you know, living uh, just down the road from here and then wound up traveling all over the place and made my way into kind of traditional academia, you could say, for my first nine years as an assistant professor. And then, you know, I, I left that position for love, moved up to New York to be with my now wife, Andy. And um, then I started doing, you know, less traditional stuff, you know, shooting videos. And actually, Andy, maybe we'll get to that story. She was the one who, like, convinced me to go on YouTube and all that. I was poo-pooing it. I was like, nah, nobody's going to want to watch this kind of crap, you know. And she, uh, you know, she, she was a uh, early and early adopter, as they call it. And so then I, I just wound up, like, doing a little bit here, you know, something new and something else. And now I'm doing, like, you no. Know, business consulting, uh, executive coaching, producing, you know, a whole bunch of different videos and nothing I really did was all that well planned. You know, sometimes people are like, well, why did you do this? And I'm like, well, cause it seemed a good idea at the time. And so I'm kind of a guy who balances, I still have a foot in traditional academia, but I get to do, there's so much more freedom in doing other things. And oh, so yeah. speculative fiction is, is something that I, you know, I've been interested in since I was a kid. I was a real geek about that that kind of stuff. And I started a series here in Milwaukee when we moved back um, with one of the local libraries. And it was originally intended to give me an excuse to do guilty pleasure reading. So, <laughs> you know, like, because I, I, I am so busy, right? And I feel bad about taking time to read say, you know, Tolkien or Martin or Le Guin or people like that. But if I was doing talks about it, then I could say I was like, it was legitimate, right? <laughs> that's that's so, my excuse too, for all buying all these books. I said, well, yeah, I got to start yeah, a YouTube there channel. You go. You're doing research, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> so so that's, that's enough, of, I think, probably of an introduction. Uh, it's kind of an unconventional one, but what we're doing here is probably not all that... Uh, the usual stuff, right? And it is cool that you brought me on for the, the 50th. I mean, I saw that it was episode 50 and I was like, oh, they've got some real staying power. That's that's good, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this show- I suppose it is a milestone, right? It's grown, um, you know, just a few episodes back, I had Tad Williams on. I've also interviewed Steven Erickson on this show and Ooh. some, you know, the, to bring on, you know, the likes of you or them, it's just, uh, it's crazy that I'm in this position considering the fact that, you know, even- five, six years ago, I wasn't reading all that much. You know, I kind of fell out of love with reading after high school and took an extended break. And I have to say, we were talking about parasocial relationships right before we, uh, we went live. Yeah. And, you know, I never thought that I would have all of these real relationships uh, after reading these books and establishing these kind of connections. And like I said, I've been watching you for so long. It feels pretty natural talking to you because I feel like I, I know a little, at least a little bit about you um, because you do all types of content over on your channel. You do philosophy, yeah. uh, AMAs where you kind of give stories about your life, which I've always really enjoyed. And uh, then obviously your speculative fiction stuff, which is what that was the hook. You got me hooked on that. And now I'm watching these half hour of Hegel and, and things like this. I mean, it's you know, incredible. I, I will say I kind of wish. So in the AMAs, people ask me a lot of stuff about philosophy, right? Because I think that's what I'm best known for. But I would like if people would ask more stuff about speculative fiction in those. It would be it, it would probably make them a little bit less philosophy heavy and, and more more fun in a way. Yeah. And you have 
a lot of good insights. So I, I feel like you're you're a resource that's kind of untapped, and at least in my little corner here on YouTube, uh, there's a lot of creators I bring on that are in like mm. this sphere. We call it BookTube. That that's what a lot of people call right, it. Right, right, yeah. You know, and uh, I'm always saying like, you guys need to go check out Dr. Gregory B. Sadler's videos. If you've if you've read Prince of Nothing, if you've read RC, if you've read Tolkien, like go check this guy out. And uh, I have a feeling that a lot of people after watching this conversation will probably be asking you questions in your oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, in your AMAs <laughs> about speculative fiction. Um, and, and you run your own uh, business company, Reason mm -hmm. IO, right? Yeah, although, you know, my title is president, but there's only one employee and that's me. So that's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds much more impressive than it is. I, you know, I have originally created the business because when I was doing public speaking and getting paid for it, I was like, how can I uh, get a tax break? Well, you, you start a business, right? <laughs> and then people started coming to me and they'd be like, hey, do you think you can do some of this? And I'd be like, I don't know, I, I guess so. You know, let's, let's try it out. And so I just rolled all of those things under the business and it, it gradually morphed into something that's, I guess you could say it's a major part of my online identity, you know? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, you've left your room somewhere to grow, right? Like, so it's scalable. If you get some employees, you already got the business set up. You already got the hierarchy. You're the pre you're the boss, you know, you get to sh call the shots. It is so underdeveloped as a business <laughs> that it has almost infinite room to grow. <laughs> <laughs> you don't so, want to peak too early. <laughs> oh, well, I don't have to worry about that. Cause I think <laughs> I've had it now about 11 years or so. Nice. So if I haven't like set the world on fire yet, I'm probably not going to do it with reason. I <laughs> Well, I think you're doing just fine. I think, I think you give yourself some credit. You've built a good thing over there. Your YouTube channel is, is big. I mean, 130 some thousand subscribers. Uh, did you ever think it was going to get that big? No. And as, so as I mentioned, um, my, my wife was the person who sort of got the ball rolling on that. She, she bought me a flip cam back in 2010 when I was like, um, traveling around with my kids because I was I was recently divorced, and um, she was like, you know, just record some stuff. And I was like, well, that sounds cool, you know. And uh, then my last semester at Fayetteville State University in North Carolina, she and I was teaching like four sections of critical thinking, which can be kind of mind on me, you know, when you're teaching the same thing over and over again, and especially that stuff. She was like, why don't you uh, why don't you start recording your lectures? And I was like, well, I guess that could be a good idea for the students because if they miss a class or something, you can go back to it. And then she's like, put it on YouTube. And I was like, who's going to want to watch this crap? You know, I'm a nobody, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's not high production like the videos that I'm seeing out there. It's just going to be me plonking a, a flip cam down. And weirdly enough, all these people started commenting on the videos and they're not even in my channel. They had to be in Fayetteville State's channel because at that uh -huh. time, uh, individuals could only like upload 15 minutes at a time and institutions could upload as long as they wanted. So, so these wow. 50 minute class sessions, they, they live over there and they're probably the majority of Fayetteville State University's YouTube channel views because they don't really do much of anything with theirs. And, uh, but anyway, people were like, you know, commenting and they're saying, ah, oh, my teacher won't like discuss anything in class. Thanks. You helped me, you know, understand this concept or save my grade. And then there were all these people who were like, um, I had to drop out of college cause I can't afford to go, or I never had the opportunity to go to college. Thanks for putting this stuff out there. Um, it feels like being in a college classroom, which made complete sense because it was recorded like from the vantage point of a student. So then when I got to, uh, when I moved up to New York and I started teaching for Marist, I asked them, Hey, can I, can I record videos? And they were like, do whatever the hell you want, you know, just don't bother us. And so I started doing that for, for intro and ethics. And, and then it just kind of spiraled from there. And, and a lot of what I've been doing is people will, um, ask me to do something. And then at, usually at first I'll be like, nah, I don't want to do that. That sounds like a terrible idea. And then I let it grow on me. And sometimes my wife intervenes as well and says, no, that actually is a good idea. And then I do it. And then turns out people do want to watch the stuff. So I'm always kind of pleasantly surprised. <laughs> yeah. Low expectations, you know, and then you've 
pleasantly surprised every single time. I I mean, let me ask you, has that been the the experience that you've had with like doing the this this show and stuff? Oh, like Yeah. Yeah. So being pleasantly surprised. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. you know, whenever I, whenever I started my YouTube channel, first off, I didn't think I was going to watch. And th this is a reoccurring mm -hmm. theme in my, in my life. I, I constantly underestimate what's going to happen. And then I always go, oh, I should have planned better. Um, the or name planned at all. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like the fantasy network was a play on network. My my name's Jimmy Nuts. Ha, yeah. ha, ha, you know, but, you know, now I'm sitting here and I'm like, yeah, it's not a it's not a great name. Uh, it's it's also typecast to be into fantasy, but I like sci-fi. I like uh, I like you know contemporary fiction as well. There's a lot yeah. of stuff I enjoy. Um, now my viewers are very forgiving, and they let me go off brand. I will say, uh, and let me talk about Cormac McCarthy and, okay. and those type of things, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, when I first started chatting with nuts, which is this show, uh, everyone that was a content creator told me it was a bad idea because like the algorithm pushes down live streams and all these things. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I don't really care. I, I just want to have fun with it. And now this is easily the most successful thing I have uh, on my channel. And it's kind of like what I've built my community around. So very surprised and very honestly humbled that I, that I now get to have these, you know, biweekly conversations with people I admire, respect, and, you know, yeah. end up being able to call peers, which is really awesome. I think, I mean, this is totally off topic. Uh, not about fantasy at, at all, but I think that like there's a lot of people out there that want to give you advice about algorithms and you know what what this wants and what should be going on with this because I, I I've gotten a lot of that advice over the years too, and I've noticed that um, there's really like three features to to that kind of advice. One is you see a lot of the, the people saying just exactly the same damn stuff over and over <laughs> and over again, right? And then you're like, well, I wonder what the source text that all these people are getting this from is because I'd rather like go check that out than listen to all of these people. Um, most of whom are just randos, you know, uh, who I didn't ask about anything. And then, <laughs> the, you know, the second thing is people seem very bold. You know, it's almost like an inverse proportion to like the less they know, the more they're willing to give advice. That right? Dunning-Kruger <laughs> effect. Right. Yeah. 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 That might have something to do with it, you know, and but I, it might also be, I don't know, like uh, there's just people who love giving advice out there. And, and the more more time you spend giving advice, the less time you have for like researching anything, you know, <laughs> <laughs> actually putting in the work that then allows you to give good advice. Yeah. And then the third thing is um, <laughs> a lot of the advice turns out to be, you know, it, it's it's let's call it semi-rational because there is like a rationale to it, but um, it doesn't apply to like the kind of thing that I'm doing. Yes. You know, and I imagine that's the same thing for you. So what might work in general well for YouTube for like cat videos or product placement or pick whatever else you want, I don't know, sports, gaming, you know, which is huge, maybe doesn't work well for intellectual content. You know, maybe yeah. we have different rules uh, I, I won't say like we have different algorithms, but maybe there's like different rules for how success works in, in mm -hmm. this kind of field, you know? Yeah, for sure. And also, uh, especially within the book sphere and then even mm. narrowing it down even more to fantasy and sci-fi speculative fiction, it's like there is a certain ceiling to that. There's also... Um, do you mean in terms of like how many people would watch or listen yeah. at any given time? Okay, yes. yeah. I yeah. feel like video games are much larger than yeah. fiction books, for instance, here on the platform. And that kind of makes sense because it's video games are a very engaging visual medium. And one of the things that happened to me all the time is like, I'm like, I'm going to start doing some editing. I'm going to figure this out. Okay. And then I'm like, I'm review. So I just reviewed uh, the um, Jade City by Fonda Lee, new uh, fantasy trilogy. And it's really good. And I was like, I'm going to get some fan art and I'm going to make some. And mm. then you realize there's only three pictures. And you're like, there's no footage, right? So like my, yeah. it's just me and my big dumb head. And I'm like, hey guys, <laughs> like this book's really cool. And there's only so many people are going to find that engaging. Whereas like yeah, watching yeah. someone review a video game and, and showing the mechanic, right? I can put up lines of text on the screen and that's nice, but it's not, I don't think it's as visually engaging as uh, something that's, like video games. That's very true. And I, you know, I will say though, you know, when you look at your analytics in, in YouTube, um, the retention rate, I think, is a lot better for book stuff than it yeah. is for really anything else. 
yeah. um, because people are watching it because they actually, well, they're watching it for several reasons. Some of them are students who are like, I got to do a book report, you know, <laughs> I need to <laughs> find out about this stuff. But the, I think the majority of people are, are watching it because they're really interested in, in the, the actual um, content, the, what it is that we're referring to, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fantasy Fanatic says, we love your big dumb, dumb head, Jimmy. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and Joanna, maybe you're right. She says readers probably have better retention. I think there's a yeah. certain amount of dedication that goes into reading a 200-page book or a 1,000-page book, you know, depending on who the author is. So yeah, sitting that, through an hour of video is not that bad. That is a great point. Um, and... You know, so you could talk about games. You could also talk about like, um, you know, TV and movie series, right? And then you can talk about actual books. And we're talking sci-fi, fantasy, speculative fiction. It's very difficult to translate um, sci-fi and fantasy when it's done well. It's not schlocky kind of stuff to mm -hmm. the big screen. And very few... Um, TV slash streaming slash uh, movie people managed to pull it off well, right? Yeah. And then, you know, games, I can't talk about that because I don't really play games, but I imagine it's kind of similar as well. So books are way more engaging, right? Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Um, the movies, it's nice to have them. I know there's a lot of like games out there because I've seen my nephew playing them. But I can't imagine that you get the same thing out of them as you do out of actually reading it and inhabiting it imaginatively. And then when you do that, you want to you want to geek out with other people that are into that in the same way that you are, right? And you can geek out with mm -hmm. people who play games with you, and you can do that with people who watch shows. Think about the Game of Thrones viewing parties people oh, yeah. used to have, right? Back yeah. before it so started to suck. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a whole conversation to, to have there about why, why that happened. But, um, maybe that, maybe there's something about the creation of community with books that's deeper than what you can get with, uh, TV slash movies or, or even games. I, I don't know about the games though. I, I, I might be talking out of my butt when it comes to that. Cause I don't spend enough time playing them, you know? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that that is true. And, there, there's something about reading also that's such an intimate one-on-one -on -one experience of you mm. and the text that to then share that experience with another person, like, cause reading is social now, especially with like platforms like these right, and, right, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, there is certain, a certain bond. Like if I know someone at work who reads, even if they don't like the same books as me, I tend to gravitate towards that person. And I find myself having almost like a tighter connection to them Yeah. compared to someone who may be uh, closer to me in age or similar taste in other things. Um, it seems like books for some reason uh, lead to uh, just stronger bonds between people for me. I think it's because nerds are enthusiastic. I think yeah, that's a big yeah. part of it. Well, you also know that the other person is willing to invest the time to appreciate the thing that you appreciate, hmm. you know? Yeah. I, maybe there's a similar thing with people who appreciate other stuff like, I don't know, you know wine enthusiasts or... Yeah. <laughs> That is I don't true. know because I have a I have a terrible palate as far as wine I can, which is actually great because I can drink five dollar wine and be perfectly happy with yep. it, right? <laughs> whereas whereas you know my my friends who have a much more refined palate they they got to spend a lot more to have a great experience. <laughs> And then, you know, and then they read Sarah J. Mass, and then you look at their palette and you're like, eh, you know, maybe it's not you yeah. know, Twilight or whatever it might be. I'm only kidding. Twilight well, you know, thing. actually, I, I was thinking of a, a funny story and this this is going to come across probably a little elitist on my part, but maybe it maybe it should. So I was working at a restaurant, uh, which is now basically defunct, called Shakey's, and they specialized in pizza and mojo potatoes. This is back in the, the late 80s. Or no, or actually early 90s. It was after I got out of the Army. And there was a girl who came up to me, and she was probably like a year younger than me. And you know, we were both like full-time restaurant employees. And she's like, I noticed that you read. And I was like, yeah, I like to read books. And she's like, I like to read books too. And I was like, oh, that's great, you know? And she's like, I'm going to share some books with you. And I was like, oh, that sounds nice, you know? So she comes in the next day and she's got like a stack of Daniel Steele. And, uh, you know, these are basically like schlocky romance novels, you know? And she's like, have you ever heard of Daniel Steele? And I was like, 
nope. But, you know, there's it's a big world, so I'm not going to say anything about it. So she's like, you, you're going to love these books. And so she hands them to me and I take them home and I start reading through it. And I was like, well, maybe it's going to get better. And it like a you know, hundred pages in it, it hadn't, you know, and, and the, to be fair, the hundred pages were very quick to, and easy to read because it's, it's not great writing. You know? <laughs> and uh, then I had to figure out how to be diplomatic, giving her books back, you know, uh, and that wasn't something I was very good at at the time either. So I was trying to like be very nice and not hurt her feelings and not also say your taste in literature sucks. <laughs> <laughs> That is a fine line to dance. That is. <laughs> yeah. I think, I don't know that I actually succeeded. I think she, she felt she got her feelings hurt, but you know, well, less than you know, right? 30 years ago. I so I'm sure she's fine now. Do you think you would do a better job today? I think so. Yeah. I, I'm sure I would come up with a better verbiage and, <laughs> you know, be a little bit more, you know, skating around it. You know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have some people saying the grandma <laughs> loves Danielle Steele. So I mean, there's an audience. There's yeah. An audience. I mean, there's there's a there's a male equivalent of that sort of stuff too. Not that men don't read romance novels, but it's been traditionally a more of a uh, a female thing. Um, mercenary novels and spy novels. A lot of them are oh, just yeah. dreck, you know. Yeah, or Tom Clancy. Like I feel like Tom Clancy's probably yeah. Up yeah, there. I'd say that. Actually, that's kind of funny too because when I was in college. We had a business professor who was like obsessed with Tom Clancy and thought he was the best author ever. And again, he gave me a book and it was uh, Some of All Fears, which oh. was um, it was not bad. You know, I could see what the attraction people had for it was. And I was like, oh, it's kind of an interesting premise, but it didn't make me want to read more Tom Clancy, you know. Yeah, you you weren't jumping, you know, to get his entire bibliography on your show. No, and, and actually, I mean, that might be a good criterion for like quality work. You know, you read a book and you're like, oh, man, this is really great. I got to read more of this person, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, Who is the author you've read the most of? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, and we're, and we're not not philosophical authors, right? But, but like yeah. speculative fiction. Man, that's a good question. Uh, it might. It, I mean, if if we're talking like in sheer number of pages as opposed to like number of books, because you know Ursula K. Le Guin writes pretty short books, right? But I've read, I think I've read every like novel and collection of short stories she's written. I haven't read all of her essays. Um, she might be the one and I'm, I'm a big fan of hers as well, but I mean, you put her stuff up against our Scott backers, um, seven volume, uh, um, Epic. yeah. A second apocalypse Long. thing. Right? Yeah. And I mean, each one is like 500, 600 pages. So he very quickly swamps that sort of competition or George R. R. Martin's, you know, a song of ice and fire still on incomplete. Um, he's got a ton of pages, you yeah. know? So that's I don't know. That's that, that is a really great question. It does sound like that. You do. You I mean, are very impartial to Gwen, Le Gwen though, you know, I have to take that back. You know who I think the person I've actually read the most of is Philip K. Dick. Okay. So In part, cause he's written so many novels, right. And, yeah. and some, and they're, they're, they're pretty short, but they're longer than Le Guin's novels tend to be, you know? Well, I'll, so I just read my first Philip K. Dick. So I, what I was it? Uh, one? it. It was Ubik. Oh, that's, and here's a, the that's thing. a great start. Here's the thing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, he was, I made a list. I said five authors I'm definitely reading this year for the first okay. time. And he was on that list. And I'm thinking dude, Philip K. Dick's books are 200, 300 pages long. I'm good. Like I can slide <laughs> this into the weekend. Due to Ubik. Might as well have been 3,000 pages because I spent half the time being like, what? What is, is going, going on? on? <laughs> like, you make, you've read it then, I assume, mm -hmm. uh, based on your reaction. I mean, how does one have such a, a novel that is questioning like what's reality? Like, I don't know how he wrote that. Like, that oh. is such an imaginative work. You know, Dick is somebody who um, he spent, he, he devoted a lot of time to reading philosophy and theology and psychology that was available at the time. And he also, you know, 
did a lot of weird stuff in his life, including, you know, taking a lot of drugs too. And um, he took enough drugs to like figure out like in Scanner Darkly that we probably shouldn't take so many drugs, you know. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, with a lot of people, it kind of burns them out. For him, it was, it was kind of catalyzing. And it, it seems like he had a real strong paranoid streak too. So he was, he was constantly thinking about these sorts of things and then talking with people about these, these sorts of things as well. And so with, I mean, Ubik is probably one of his best novels. It was so um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Scanner Darkly, uh, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said, um, obviously Dandre's Dream of Electric Sheep. Um, you know, another really good one is Man in the High Castle. All of those are like, you know, the really great dick ones. Uh, he did write some schlock too, you know, because he had to pay the bills. Uh, so, so not every novel is, is really great, but it's interesting because in his exegesis, even some of the schlocky stuff like Maze of Death or um, Clans of the Alpine Moon, Alpine Moon, um, he, he figures them as part of this like vast experience that he thinks he's involved in where an extraterrestrial intelligence slash like Gnostic savior has connected up with him in, in his life. And so his writing in his own view is supposed to be like responding to that, you that know? So, so, so that gives you kind of a depth. <laughs> I mean, that is a great way to set up someone. If I hand them Ubik, like they need to listen to mm. that first. Cause I thought I was just reading like a good old, like high concept sci-fi 300 yeah. page burner. Like I'll be done with this in a day. <laughs> nope. Not at all. I felt like I took LSD when I finished it. I was, like, you know, wild. that's, that's actually a, a, an interesting criterion for really great fantasy and sci-fi literature does it stick with you afterwards? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it something that you can't, you can put the book down, but you can't stop thinking about the ideas in it? That's a hundred percent something that I, I, the more and more I read, you know, the yeah, hundreds of yeah. books I've read over the last few years, it's like, those are the ones that become hallmarks. And th some of them aren't even like my favorite books, but they're ones that are just like stuck in my mind. Um, Remembrance mm -hmm. verse past. Um, oh, the yeah, yeah. I just finished that. I made a video for it. And it is one that, I mean, the last book is just in, I've never read a book packed with that many ideas. And it felt like I was just taking like KO blows to the brain, you know, every 50 pages. And it's just it's a wild thing. And it's also not your typical approach to, to narrative, at least in the, for a Western audience. Yeah. These vast time jumps and kind of just skipping over character beats like it's very much all about those ideas and then kind of the impact on, on the um the society, right? Like society right, is the right. character almost. And you know, oof. somebody who's like that and much earlier who pulled it off in one book and I think didn't pull it off in, in necessarily the others is Ola Stapleton. Hmm. Um, he has this, uh, I think star maker is great that way. And it's, and it's a similar kind of like, it's over like billions of years, you know, star maker. Yeah. And then there's the, the first and the last men, um, which is also similarly like, you know, this, this incredible long panoramic thing, but I, I don't think actually brought it off quite as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was a great series. Um, yeah. I also, uh, you know, I read, um, his shorter, I think novella, the wandering earth. That's, that's the one everyone keeps well. commenting. They keep commenting on oh, that interesting. video. And they're saying you have to read Wandering Earth. And I'm like, it's, it's good. It's good. And and the, the book that you get it with has is bundled together with a bunch of short stories that are also very interesting, too. Nice. I really enjoy um, science fiction in, in the short form. I love Ted Chiang. I think he's wonderful. Okay. Um, have you read any of his bind ups? No, I've only heard about him, but I haven't gotten to him yet. Yeah, he uh, he's one definitely I think you would enjoy. I know that you get recommended books all the time. So, yeah, no, no, no harm if you don't read it within the next 10 years. But, um, well, you know, that's where the world's of speculative fiction series is great because I get these recommendations and then I they're usually people that I've heard of but don't know their work. And then I'm like, well, yeah, I've, I should probably get to them. And there's so many. Well, our Scott Bach Backer was uh, one of those kind of. Uh, things I, I wouldn't have read the guy uh, partly because I I thought well he's a he's a philosopher who's writing stuff it's probably not going to be very good you know um, <laughs> and I, and I was you know 
astounded by how great it was, but you know, um, uh, Olivia Butler, you know, I've done uh, her Xenogenesis series and her Parable series, and those were a result of people like recommending her. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Chang might make it into the next year's lineup. Uh, this year, I'm actually, uh, the next two sessions are uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Ooh. stuff, which, nice. you know, again, I, I was prepared not to like and uh, have been astounded by how good this stuff is have you read his his uh so i have not but i did pick up i think it's the future ministry or something okay. like that i picked that up um probably like two months ago but i haven't got to it yet now yeah the 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 mars series um starts out a little kind of like ray bradbury ish and mm -hmm you know, with like a, a party that's happening and then it starts, you know, focusing on these, these characters, but it's, it's, uh, the, and I'll say this, not just about him, but about so many of these other great writers, they show this, um, sort of systematic thinking things through with all these different characters and motivations. They're really doing great philosophy hmm. sort of like through the, the medium of, narrative literature you know yeah and is is that something like it, that that's kind of where these two things collide right mm -hmm. uh, i know you talk about it in in the um worlds of speculative fiction series you talk about it through world building and yeah yeah you know yeah. some could you give some examples of that as someone who does you know philosophy yeah i mean so world building we almost we should you know we should beware of using it as like one single term that like covers everything because um, the way that some people do world building is so incredibly intricate and thoughtful and well worked out. And then other people are basically like making D and D maps and, you know, here's where the mountains go and we'll, we'll make up some languages that basically sound like French or Spanish or Russian or things <laughs> like that. Right. You know? uh, and then there's everything in between. And so you know, recently I did um, Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos, which the first two books, the Hyperion books, um, already very vast in, in scope and world building and thinking about the nature of uh, autonomous intelligences, which is the word he prefers to artificial intelligences and how they would, how they would develop and play out. Right. So the first two books has this incredibly complicated plot and, um, all this cool stuff happening with different factions, right? That, that's all world building, right? There's a history there and you got to have the characters motivations. Um, and then the next two books, which some people don't like, you know, they think, Oh, it's not as good as the first two. I think they're even better. Um, hmm. They're happening. The end of the end uh, ones um, they're happening 250 years after the previous events, but some of the characters are still alive, you know? So um, there's some uh, really amazing world building that's cosmological in its nature being revealed there, you know, hmm. and, and um, apparently, you know, he's not like Tolkien where Tolkien kind of mapped everything out in terms of how these things worked uh, before um, he, you know, he, he thought it through, but it took, took a long time. Backer is another great example of that. I mean, 20, essentially 20 years of prep for the first book in the Prince of Nothing series. And then he's got to like churn them out one after the other, because now he's making money and, and the press wants him to capitalize on that. And he's got to like, you know, expand this uh, world that he's, he's built. And then, you know, you look at the, the next four after the Prince of Nothing series and there's still, excellent world building going on exploring yeah. the northern areas that haven't been talked about or you know um i mean this is this this won't make any sense to people who haven't read it but there's a kingdom called zelm you know <laughs> <laughs> that starts to become important as well you know um so i i don't know if that answered your question i just kind of like spilled over into a bunch of different people but no, no. I think it shows that, you know, in sci-fi and in fantasy that, that we can explore philosophical means through, through mm. world building. Um, I think this is also a good time for Dr. Philip Chase's question, which is a um, question for Dr. Sadler. What is one of the most Ooh. philosophical stories from speculative fiction that you enjoy discussing? And what is the philo uh, philosophy behind it? Well, that's interesting. Um, 
I mean, a lot of Dick's good stories, not the schlocky ones, are are very philosophical, and the characters actually discuss philosophy. You know, um, and what I what part of what I like about Dick is the characters are never like. And here's the Kantian professor who presents Kant perfectly. Mm-hmm. It's always kind of like an eccentric view. Like, here's what I think is valuable in Kant, and can this apply to our screwed up relationship that we have? You know, um, and by the way, the aliens are coming. What 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 would, what would they think about that? So I mean, Dick has a lot of uh, great ones that way. I mean, we we're just talking about. Uh, um, Dan Simmons and the Hyperion Cantos. And I think there's an incredible philosophical depth to, to his um, world that he develops in there. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, um, you know, her stuff is philosophical, but it's, it's not in quite as in your face a way. And, and there's like in the Earthsea stories, for example, or in the Heinish novels, her writing, um, there's a lot of space in it and it allows you to kind of enter into it. And I think part of what's really important with her as an author, she's really, at least from my point of view, she's really figured out how within that space to allow you to emotionally connect with the characters in just a few lines, you know, and that, and that is philosophical. The emotions are just as important as rationality is to us. Um, she also has elements of Taoism, I would say, mm-hmm. in Ursi. Um, whenever I oh, was yeah. watching yeah. some of your videos and then doing deeper research on like Tombs of Atuan and beyond, mm-hmm. um, that was kind of what I uh, came across. And it was it was a rabbit hole for me to go down because, believe it or not, I hadn't studied a lot of Taoism. Uh, but it's it's really amazing how she kind of just floats things in there. And um, it, they can go undercurrent and you would never know. Yeah, she's she's I mean she taught writing, you know, (laughs) that was, uh, she wrote a lot of things, but she also, you know, taught these classes and it would be incredible to have like had the opportunity to get to work with her. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately she's gone, you know, recently, I think it was, was 2018 that she died. Yeah. It was within the last like five, I think she's been gone for five years. I, I think. Yeah. That sounds about right. I mean, who else? Um, I mean, Octavia Butler, you know, her, her parable series, which she didn't get to finish that had, a, I mean, she was developing like a new philosophical slash religious perspective in it as this thing she was calling earth seed. And I, I've wanted to go back to those and like put all the different passages together and like look at it as a, a philosophy and see what, mm-hmm. what would, come up and i'm sure somebody's done it on a website already um <laughs> i'll be reading a uh, parable of the sower this year and that'll be my oh. first butler novel i've actually never oh, really read. okay her, her and dick were on that list of five people to read and uh but yeah who else who else was on that list well i was afraid you'd ask me that because now i can't really remember <laughs> Let me pull up my video real quick. Um, I know Michael Moorcock is also on there, which is oh. funny because you mentioned Michael Moorcock quite a bit when you talk about Philip K. Dick, because he was a very big Philip K. Dick fan, right? Yeah, and Moorcock's a really interesting guy. Hates um, Tolkien. I oh yeah, yeah. Hated him. I I loved when I was in high school the Cornelius Chronicles, and that that lasted into college. And I would like you know read these books that I bought at a used bookstore, and like you know drink my 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 tea and listen to you know like Van Halen in the background, and it was like it's kind of a milieu that I was was in. And I came back to them to check them out at in the first year se- first uh, year of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. And almost everybody else who I came back to, you know, like Tolkien or, you know, Zelazny or Le Guin, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I, there's so much more richness here. The Cornelius Chronicles did not date well. I don't really? think. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It, but I think that his other stuff, like the Elric stuff, um, you know, there's another hero that he has as well. And I'm trying to remember his name. Um, I think that stuff might hold up better, although I haven't gone back to it. But, uh, you know, Moorcock was also very interesting because he got he got into the music scene, right? He contributed to um, one of the albums of the band Hawkwind. Um, and there was another band that he was associated with. I'm trying to remember who it was, but I can't remember right off the bat. Um, 
and you know that was part of like the scene right you know yeah um there and there were others too like um that that got into that not not the music scene necessarily but like let's call it the interesting culture scene roger zelazny clearly was involved with oh, that yeah. um uh the kane guy um carl edward wagner was was attuned to that sort of stuff as well it looks like george r, r. martin might have been kind of into that too you know yeah i know I, tad williams played in a jazz band he was oh, he did was, he yeah, okay I, I believe it was jazz but he was definitely involved in music and he's actually uh he looked up the moorcock so tad williams is an interesting person because he loves michael moorcock like okay he, he always points to him as one of his biggest influences and also he loves tolkien mm. and whenever he came on i was like so why does Michael hate Tolkien so much? And he, you know, he, oh, he was diplomatic. I mean, he, <laughs> Tad Williams is an absolute delight of a human being. I mean, Rad Tad is, he's a gem. And, you know, he just talked about how Michael Moorcock had a different view of, of class than what Tolkien did. And that's where a lot of yeah. his types came from. And, and I think too, a different understanding of um, violence and evil, hmm. you could say, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's interesting too because Martin doesn't doesn't uh, he says some some nasty things about Tolkien from time to time as well. But you can tell he also really likes and, yes. and thinks that you know Tolkien kind of broke ground for him as well. Oh, yeah. by the way, you know, two other people who interacted that we've already talked about they actually went to the same high school together, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin and Philip K. Dick. Really? But they didn't meet in high school. They it was a huge high school. So they they didn't meet up with each other, but then they met afterwards. <clears throat> and Laguine did not like Dick's heavy drug use. And at one point, you know, Why I actually not? told them to like, well, because you know, <laughs> she thought it made him unstable. It wasn't good for him. She didn't want him around her kids, you know. Well, that's fair. Too. Yeah, so fair. and he was a hot mess. So um <laughs> <laughs> but they but they they complemented each other's works. That's you know? so interesting. You know, Steven Erickson and Guy Garvoke also went to the same high school in Canada. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, they didn't go at the same time, but they went to the same high school. Okay. Yeah, th there's a lot of really great Canadian fantasy authors. I mean, our Scott uh, Baker also. He's he's Canadian as well. Yep. Yep. Um, and then there's many many more. Uh, one of the newer ones is Nicholas Ames. I know that I I think he's also from that same area. Like, there's something okay. in the water up. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Maple, maybe it's the maple. I don't know, but yeah. I mean, in the case of our Scott Backer, I think part of it was uh, playing D and D so much as yeah. as a kid. And I know, you know, I, I played it when I was young, and I, I was I'm old enough that like I got to see the book slowly coming out, you know, and like the the thing would expand, and you'd be like, "Holy crap!" You know, the new yeah. module is in the hobby store. We got to get our, our hands on it, you know. And then you start making your own stuff. And, yeah, there were there were also other interesting rival games out there. You would like you would get the Dragon, which was the official magazine of TSR Press, and there'd be all sorts of like crazy story, you know, um, articles in there, uh, introducing like new ideas and stuff like that. And then you'd see the advertisements, and they'd be for like games that you'd be like, "Wow, I don't I don't even know where that uh, where you buy this game." You know, but people were playing these somewhere, you know, yeah. growing, growing up where I did in the sticks out, out here in Wisconsin, you'd have to kind of work to, to, to find, you know, people to play with. Um, but you got the idea that in, you know, more populous areas, people were like really having a great time with this stuff. You yeah. Know? Yeah, it led to a lot of creation. And uh, Noel actually was asking if you've ever read Malazan, which I have kind of a story that relates to you about that, which I'll jump to. But Malazan was actually built from a tabletop game. Oh, and really? It was a home, a homegrown fantasy RPG. Okay. And they had their own rule system. And a lot of the decisions that are in the book were decided in those games. In the campaigns. Okay. Which, which is just insane. And then the person who helped Steven Erickson create this world and gamed with him was Ian C. Esselmont, and he ends up writing the expanded Malazan universe books. Oh, so two okay. friends that game together had created this thing. And it's really fascinating because, you know, at a time whenever uh, this come out, you know, D and D was really big, but the cool thing about Malazan is that there's actually no patriarchy built in like a okay. lot of fantasy, like defaults yeah, to patriarchy. Yeah. There is no no existence of it in Malazan, but it's not acknowledged. It's not like, hey, look at us. We don't have a patriarchy. It just is. 
Okay. Which makes it very, you know, unique in that sense, especially yeah. for that time period. But um, so I got to be honest with you. Yeah. You uh, you put out your poll and you said, what should I read? You oh, know, were you one of the people who voted for that? Oh, was I one of them? I, I weaponized my community <laughs> and I said, you guys got to get. get well, you know, I, I am uh, doing it at near the end of the year. I forget it whether worked. it's like ac- October, or November, or December, but but I am. That is one of the ones that I'm I'm doing this year it was one of the fan favorites yes. um, that makes me so happy it's yeah i'm trying to remember that poll there was like there's a lot of one of them there. oh it was the i think it was the no it wasn't the sepkowski because that was from the year before there was somebody who was in the poll who just like trounced everybody else um it was the horror uh thomas was Ligotti? it the Lagodi thing Ligotti, yeah, yeah i'm gonna be doing him um there was there was somebody else that Somebody had really insisted should be in the poll when I put it in there and it got very few votes. Hmm. Um, I'm kind of blanking on, on who I'm not going to lie to you. I just saw Steven Erickson Malazan and I windmill dunked that button. I was like, that's, that's, the uh, one. that's great. I mean, that's how it should work, right? If there, if there is a community of people out there who want engagement with it, then I think that's perfectly fine. Right. Yeah, I think I think you'll uh, you'll find some some good stuff about it. I'm really excited to uh, to get your take, and um, especially if you make it into like book two, um, which is you know one of my favorites out of the uh, the bunch. But well, I'm going to be doing three, I think, oh, if I remember yeah. right. Oh, oh, and I'm doing Terry Pratchett uh, as well. Oh, you just made uh, a lot with of that though. Happy. You gotta um, you really have to like decide well because there's too many books, right? Which yes. which ones are you actually going to to do uh so i'm doing the ones that are focused on on death yeah okay so i got i got 50 responses uh yeah thomas legati got 46 percent steven erickson and terry pratchett each got 18 percent oh uh robert chambers the king in yellow and some of his other stuff people are like oh you should do that classic horror you know classic weird and it got um it got two votes. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't didn't come through. No, no. And then there was the Arcadian Boris Strugatsky's noon stuff, oh, okay. and then uh, M. John Harrison's Verconium series, which I don't I don't really know, but um, maybe maybe next year, you know, I'll do that. So yeah, yeah but you, so you got to get a good grassroots movement, you know, and get people on uh, on the voting. I. Uh, I definitely had a couple of people go and vote for Malazan because I was like, I promise you guys, this will be great. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's. I, I think that I think that's smart. You know. Yeah, it's uh, it's some really good stuff, especially books two and three. I think I think you'll really enjoy. Uh, Erickson was an archaeologist, and it shines oh, through. Okay. And his understanding of passing of time is is evident, and uh, he takes a lot of care of details that other people don't really know. Like we talk about world building. Well, yeah, yeah. From his gaming background and then archaeology and you combine and you just have something that for me is very unique. Have, have you read a uh, black company by Glenn cook? No. Okay. So that was one of the big influences on Malazan. And there's a piece of Malazan that does feel very black company esque, but it also um, goes all the way back to Ronnie Howard's Conan as well, okay. which is Erickson really took more inspiration from those people and um and steven donaldson then tolkien oh interest so it, it's it's a different flavor of fantasy in a lot of ways and it's one of the giants now you know it's okay. one of the pillars and um yeah i'm so excited uh to to hear you break that down i think it's going to be great you know if i so steven donaldson is he the one who had the um thomas covenant yeah okay so i i was i was blanking on that a little bit I, I read those when I was in middle school and high school because um, they were being you know brought out um, at that time and they you know they're really well written but I there was something about them that I found just off-putting hmm. and I can't put my finger on it and I tried rereading them uh, a couple of years ago and I, I just couldn't get into them you know yeah. Um, and I don't know, I don't know exactly what it is. It's not that like, you know, the flawed, you know, uh, hero, maybe he is a little bit too whiny. Um, 
<laughs> leprosy is a tough one, right? It's <laughs> yeah. There's something about the we we're talking about you know the world building. There was something about the world that I didn't I didn't really like, and I and I never could quite figure it out. You know, and I felt like well I sh I should like be more open to this and and receptive, mm -hmm. but I, I I couldn't be. You know. Yeah, I uh, so I actually tried Thomas Covenant in, in book one, and I got about 200 pages in, and I ended up not finishing it, which is very really? rare for me. Yeah, I, I'm going to revisit it at some point, but for, for me, I felt like the... Uh, it, I, I'm a, I love a boring book. Like I always tell people, I love glacial <laughs> pasting. Like I'm in, I love yeah. it. Um, but for me, the actually a little bit similar to you is like, I didn't feel really immersed in the world. And then we're spending 10, 20 pages on the world. Mm. And I'm just like, mm. I really like the first like 80 pages. I thought the first 80 pages were just like fire. I, I love that. Okay. And then after we get into the world and whatnot, it slowed down quite a bit for me. Um, but yeah. I, I'll try it again one day because I usually just trust that I'm wrong. Like that's just how I operate. I'm just always assuming I'm the wrong one. Um, but it's I mean, when it, when, it, when it, when it comes to, when it comes to literature that, that, and, and oftentimes uh, music, if it's complex, that's probably a good assumption on our part that hmm. it's not something radically wrong with the, the book. It's some, somehow we're not able to appreciate what's what's there you know oh yeah absolutely and i think it comes into like how you approach the work what time that you're reading it like in your life and, right yeah um, yeah yeah zan has a great question it leads right in this is how do you suggest approaching the very dense stuff philip k dick wolf mm -hmm. stuff that at first time reader you might feel like you hit a brick wall you know there's good stuff in there but it feels hidden do you have any kind of suggestions for that yeah and i like that you brought up uh uh wolf because that um you know um what is it tales of the new sun the book of the new book sun. of the new sun yeah. yeah that that is really dense there's and there is an awful lot of world building going on in there um i mean i don't think that dick isn't as dense in the in the way that wolf is wolf is very baroque you know um whereas dick is a little bit more hard-boiled mm -hmm. kind of detective kind of stuff um so maybe two different kinds of approaches. So so Wolf, maybe we would put in there also our Scott Backer, yeah, and, for sure, and some other things that can be slogs. Um, maybe that's the way we should talk about it. Um, I mean, you know, there there is the the aspect of sometimes you do have to like let it lay fallow and then come back to it later. And you've changed in the process and you can interface with the work a bit better. Um, I found that to be the case for me for, with, with some authors. I've also noticed too, that there were, there were quite a few authors where as I was reading them when I was younger, I skipped over quite a few things. And then, <laughs> cause I was more interested in like, well, what's going to happen? You know, I'm not, I'm yeah. not quite so interested in all the relationships in the world and the metaphysics. Um, so maybe, you know, being, being kind of forgiving with yourself about that and not thinking that, well, I have to slog through this because I've opened the book and I've gotten, you know, a hundred pages in and it's an investment. I mean, it's okay to like put something down and go read something you'd rather read later. Um, there is one thing though, where I, I think you can say that Dick and Wolf and some of these other, um, writers, maybe there's something you can do that would help you out. And that is when, if, if you're finding yourself caught up because you don't really get the concepts that are being bandied about, right? Like, so like Dick is relying on a lot of psychology terminology that we don't use anymore. Back, back then, you know, it was like DSM-2 and DSM-3 and they talked in terms of psychosis and neurosis. And he loves using words like schizoid, which, you know, we don't, we don't really diagnose people that way these days. And it was like part of the whole culture too, you know, like the schizoid personality. Then you want to, you want to like dig around and find out, well, what the hell are they actually talking about? You know? Yeah. Um, and this, you know, I think this could go for a lot of authors that are distanced from us by, you know, 30 years or more. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's um, there's language, there's cultural assumptions that are built in, and so maybe if you figure out what those are, it helps you. Like it unlocks things. You know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of cultural reference in speculative fiction that are 
you know, they're, they're going to be lost uh, <laughs> to most readers within a hundred years or so. Yeah. And then it just becomes more of the original world building, I guess. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, like, I'm thinking about like say Rogers Lasney's Amber series, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that are being referenced because the Lasney does reference pop culture a lot. Yeah. That um, you know, people are just gonna not get unless they're antiquarians way down the line, you know? Yeah. And is that a you know, can we put that on the barometer of success? Like if a work is timeless, it does it get more value than something that isn't probably right. Yeah. But a lot of timeless works, we have to, we have to do a lot of work to unlock them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that holds um, not just for this kind of literature, but older literature as well. Like, you know, if you're going to read the song of Roland, for example, it's great work, you know, yeah. wonderful uh, story, but there's a lot of stuff where you're, you got, you know, when you first read it, you're going to be like, what the hell is this word? <laughs> Why are they behaving this way? You know? Um, so I, I think the stuff that's, you know, closer to us in time, like, like Dick or Gene Wolfe, um, there might be, there might, like, I've always wanted to write something that would be like an annotated glossary. Yeah. I guess that you'd call it a glossary of sorts for Dick's works where it would take like all the philosophical, references all the religious references all the psychological references and just say here's what he actually means by this or here's what was going on that people were talking about this and it would be kind of a useful tool for readers but i don't know that that many people would you know buy it so it'd have to be more of a labor of love when i have the time to do it you know well, I'd pre-order it, so you're you're, you're good to go. Because <laughs> after Ubik, I'm in. Like I'm pretty much sold on that. Um, I was just reading. Uh, it, it, I do a book of the month here on the channel, and I let my patrons uh, pick a random book. I put on a wheel and I spin it and all this stuff. Oh, and, wow. uh, that's yeah, a great it's really, idea. It's really fun to be honest, because there's stuff that I would have never read. Like for instance, I don't know if you've ever heard of this book, but it's called Stoner by John Williams. No. So, uh, quick story about Stoner. Um, I thought I was going to hate this book and it's actually not about marijuana at all. Like that was the okay. biggest, I yeah, thought it was that's, like that's the first thing you think of. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh, this is gonna be great. So John Williams wrote, uh, back in the day, I don't want to put the date on, I'll say the fifties, forties, okay. it's maybe sixties. I can't remember. But, uh, when it came out, it was, it bombed. It absolutely bombed. Mm. People said it was garbage. And in a lot of ways it was supposed to be the opposite of the great Gatsby. It's about a middling, uh, professor at a college who is just doing okay. And, has a really rough relationship with his wife and is kind of distanced from his. I mean, it's a really sad and terrible book. I mean, it's, it's, it's depressing to be quite frank, but yeah. years after John Williams died, it became, it got like a second wind as a lot of works happen. Huh. And uh, so anyways, this is a book I would have never read, but it got on my patron wheel. I read it and it's one of my favorite books of all time. And now I've wow. read, I've read almost everything John Williams has put out, which isn't a ton, but um, you know, he did Augustus, which is just amazing. It's it's written in like letters back and forth to the leaders of Rome. And OK, I mean, just a really he's an incredible author. I would have never got. But the reason why I'm saying this is because we're talking about older works. And I got Lud in the Mist by Hope uh, Merlis. Have you ever seen this? No, I had neither. So this came out back in 1926 and she wrote some other stuff. But this is her only fantasy. And huh. the cool thing about that date is this predates Tolkien. This is before Hobbit, and it is amazing. Uh, I'm reading it right now, and it has a little bit of a fairy tale feel to it, but it is amazing how much the world is fleshed out, and you're just looking at something that does not have any Lord of the Rings influence at all, which is very, it seems rare, right? It okay. seems rare. It's not because there's hundreds and hundreds of years prior, but this yeah. book is so impressive. I, I am very, very much enjoying it. I'm only about maybe 20% of the way in, but this is one that kind of feels timeless to me because okay. it is uh, a little heavy on some of the allegory um, and life and art is a theme in it and it's explored. And I think it's uh, I think it's a good, good story. So, you know, this is something I would consider maybe possibly in that realm of like, you would never know whenever it was written. Like it doesn't feel like it was written in 19. Oh yeah. 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 So, uh, and it's also short, which is always welcomed because <laughs> in fantasy that rarely happens, but, um, 
just really interesting to see something that's that's pre Tolkien because everything has had you know George R. R. Martin says it's the giant that looms on anyone that writes in the genre right, right? and yeah yeah and he's not wrong and it's just I thought I thought it was really incredible to read this and it's not um it's not super popular but Neil Gaiman loves it and so did hmm. Le Guin like if I could ever say if I found someone that I think Le Guin was mirroring it might have been this. Oh, that's very interesting. And another thing that clicked for me, which I'm sure you've read this, but Elfland to Poughkeepsie, the essay. Oh, right. Yeah. You know what Elfland is? It's in Lud in the Mist. There's a place called Elfland. Oh, and I'm like, it? okay. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh my goodness. Like all these pieces are connecting together. So it's like this big, you know, really cool random story that again came from a random Patreon uh, pick. And I'm like, wow, look at all these connections and stuff. But it, it came to my mind because we were kind of talking about like older works and maybe getting yeah. lost. Um, that's definitely one I could see um, people reading down the road and being like, where was this all of our lives? So not to gush. You know, I, that, that reminds me of something. I, I didn't like read literature let's even say but let alone like sci-fi fantasy horror you know all the th things that we put into speculative fiction in any sort of systematic way i started when i was quite young and you know you'd go to the library and generally your parents would be like oh great you're in the library you're out of our hair go spend as much time as you want there you know and wander around and i would you know like find books and i'd be like oh you know this this sounds interesting i don't know who this person is sometimes i'd even pick a book because i thought the author's name sounded interesting you know and I'd, I'd pull it out and, you know, sometimes I, they were real duds, sometimes they weren't. But I also had this great uncle, Uncle Hubert, who uh, was, he only went to third or fourth grade. Uh, he had to drop out of school because he was the oldest in his family and so he had to work. But he was a great bibliophile and he collected books. And he'd, he'd take them wherever he could get them, you know, like a seminary clothes, he'd take all their books and then, you know, keep some of them and throw the rest out. Uh, and he was constantly giving people books and he was very generous. He would let me go through his library, which was in the basement of his, his house and take anything I wanted. You know, I didn't even have to ask permission. I could just it's like amazing. take a book and he knew he was probably never going to get it back, you know, <laughs> and he'd let me have it. And so that's how I encountered like A. Van Vogt and Catherine Moore and um you know right now actually this this weekend I'm going to be doing a live reading of um uh, one of my favorite short stories the game of rat and dragon cordwainer smith and I, I got introduced to that through some sci-fi anthology that I I picked out of his his bookshelf and so a lot of it is um kind of you know, it's, it, it, to even call it contingent doesn't go far enough. It's just very random. And, yeah. you know, um, I've been very fortunate in the things that I randomly encountered and thought look cool. So actually, too, I should mention, like, if, you know, I would go to the library in the Waukesha Library and they had, you know, those... Um, spinny things where it's like a whole bunch of paperbacks and yeah you can turn it so if there was a cover that looked particularly interesting i'd read that book you know <laughs> i mean i wish we still had covers like that i love those old like pulpy. That's true. Yeah, yeah oh they were so good now it's just words you know or it's something very artsy you know yeah like this is this is miserable what are we doing george like this is garbage i can't stand this i hate it yeah. great great book but can't yeah, it. it does. There's nothing compelling about it, you could say. Yeah, I actually uh, so I just read the Anubis Gates by Tim Powers, um, which mm. if you haven't read Tim Powers, I think no, I have haven't a little bit of PKD in there, but okay. uh, a little more on the fantasy side. Um, this book is insane, but it has, uh, you know, the Sphinx, like there's a Sphinx and the sun and a time. It's time travel. It's crazy. OK, but like, you know, that, that cover has some character to it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think we're all cover buyers at some point in our lives or not, uh, you know, one time. Or you are right though. There, there used to be such cool trippy covers. Yeah. You know? I actually, there's, there's quite a few Twitter accounts that um, scour the internet, <clears throat> find these things. And then like put like um, there's one and I'm trying to remember her name. Uh, and she, she's like something librarian, and she she'll do like whole series of amazing old sci-fi stuff. Um, I would love librarian. To see that. 
is is what it is and it's just at pulp librarian um but there's a whole bunch of others who, who do that kind of stuff and I, I i love looking at these old covers of stuff she also I, i'm looking at it right now she also does like album covers and other Very things cool. as well that are kind of goofy too so yeah and it, it definitely fit the genre back then too um i love the hyperion cover with the shrike on the oh, front yeah yeah so good one of the most horrifying you know creatures i guess we would call it in in sci-fi or fantasy in my opinion yeah what 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 should we i mean it's an entity is it a force is it a creature mm -hmm. i mean technically speaking and i i'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler it is a creature because somebody did make it um, right i won't say who uh or how how it came to be but yeah i mean for for your your viewers who don't know it it's this three meter tall thing that's made of like razor wire and steel spikes. And it's called the Shrike because there, there is actually a bird called, called the Shrike that finds its prey and it likes to stick it onto thorns. And the Shrike has like an entire gigantic cosmic tree of not thorns, but like spears that it will take its victims and stick them on. <laughs> 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 Pretty horrifying. Right. And, um, yeah, it's it. I mean, it, apparently too. In interviews, he said that he came up with the Shrike before the, the 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 narrative. It was something that he mm. had talked about with his uh, his uh, grade schoolers, because you know he was he was a a writing teacher. I did not know that. <clears throat> yeah. How interesting. He probably gave some of them nightmares. You know? <laughs> I would assume so. <laughs> if he was brainstorming that up, yeah, yeah, I would say so for sure. My, this is totally off topic, but my, my dad was, uh, uh, he, unfortunately he died rather young. He was only 36 mm -hmm. when he died, but he was a great, great storyteller. And he would, um, he would tell us scary stories. And this is back when we were living out in the sticks near, uh, this, this village of Wales. And so we're living in a subdivision and, you know, all the neighbors know each other. And so the kids would come over and we had a fireplace. So he'd light a fire in the fireplace and people would have hot cocoa and popcorn. And then he'd come out and he'd say, you want to hear some stories? And this only lasted a very short time because we were used to his scary stories, which would be like, you know, he'd make them up on the spot about a wolf man or, you know, th this or that. So the stories that he told were so scary that the other kids went home and then had nightmares and then all the other parents were ticked off at him for having like you know screwed up their kids and they wouldn't <laughs> let they, they would let them come over for other stuff but they there was no more story time for the neighborhood <laughs> after that reminds me whenever i was a kid people would come over to my house and then i'd make them watch evil dead with bruce campbell mm. which the first one you know everyone yeah, remembers yeah. them as funny but the first one's terrifying the yeah. first one's very scary and you know low budget but it had like a grittiness and a realness to it where you're like you know what is this and i used to show that <laughs> to kids in like sixth grade and i didn't have a lot of sleepovers after that i, uh, <laughs> I was the weird kid i guess yeah yeah I saw that I, I think in college and I found it terrifying then, you know. Oh yeah. It's uh it's it's still to this day, you know, the cellar scene where she's like knocking and I'm fine oh, now. I mean, it's it's wicked stuff. Yeah. They should have left whenever the swing was banging against the cabin. I mean, you gotta know you gotta leave. <laughs> like there's no reason to go in that cabin. Yeah. <laughs> Zen has another great question. Uh, it says, has there ever been anything you've tried to produce a world's uh, talk for that just hasn't had enough meat to work with? I don't think that's happened so far, but it could always be the case. Stay um, tuned. <laughs> you know, because I've, I've done them in two different formats, right? So there's been like there was the in-person and then I would come and I, I could count on my audience like having something to say because a lot of them were quite opinionated. And sometimes it would be on topic, sometimes it'd be off topic. And sometimes some of them would have read the stuff and some of them wouldn't. So that was never a problem for that. Um, doing it in the new format, which I started doing during COVID where I'm like stitching together a whole video, I'm actually having the opposite problem, which is <laughs> I want to keep them at 90 minutes and I'm, I'm going way the hell over a lot of the time. I love it. Well, it's, it's. You know, I don't like the fact that I promise at the beginning, it's going to be 90 minutes this time. And then I okay. come up with more stuff like the last, 
I think the Witcher one came out to be about like almost two hours, wow. you know, of, of stuff. And, um, I, you know, I've got um, C.H. Chera's, um, I'm going back to the Alliance Union universe, and I've picked three relatively short books in that, one of which I just like blazed my way through in a day uh, a couple days ago and really enjoyed. I, I love her as an author. I mean, that universe is really, really cool. Um, the characters are, are quite compelling, and, and each book is so, so different than the others. Um, but there might not be that much material there. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe I, I might do a shorter one. Who knows? Um, I will say this, though. I did, I did do one uh, special interview with um, James Kennedy, who is a recent author who wrote this really great book called Dare to Know. And I got sent a copy of it. He has a publicist and the publicist like, you know, emailed me. They're like, they've got this great philosophical uh, science fiction book. It's sort of like, you know, uh, Philip Dick meets, meets death of a salesman. And as I'm reading this, I'm like inwardly groaning. I'm like, oh, this is going to be crap. You know? <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I wrote them and I was like, yeah, go ahead and send me the book, you know? And within like five pages, I was, I was hooked and it wow. was, it was a, a great book. And so um, I did a short, like maybe hour long interview with him about that, but there, you know, there wasn't enough to like do a whole worlds of speculative fiction session on because it's only one book. So, and it's not, it's, you know, there are some one books that you can do that with like um, I'm blanking on the name. It's like a thousand pages uh, or so. Um, it's about this monastic community. Hmm. Uh, damn! I've, <laughs> now I'm curious. You had me at a thousand pages. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, it was one of the ones that. Um, oh, Anathem. That's. What, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Stevenson. I think. Yeah, Neil Stevenson. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So you can do a session on just one book if it's a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, you couldn't do like Wizard of Earthsea probably and get enough meat out of that because it's what, like 110 pages? Yes. And, and and you need the other stuff that goes with it, the Tombs of Atuan and uh, that book is so far the shore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to read book four. That's that's the one I'm on. Ooh, I just finished for the, so yeah, I, that's what everyone says. <laughs> when it says it's so good. I'm really, really excited for it. Not only is it so good, um, I won't say anything about the ending because it's going to be a surprise. And... You know, Le Guin herself recognized that she was doing something new with this, you know, mm -hmm. reapproaching the Earthsea stuff. Um, I mean, there's this beautiful depth to all of the Earthsea stuff, but it, it gets way deeper in Tahanu, I would say. You know, it's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I found it's, book two. It's gut wrenching, though, too, though. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Book two blew me away. I made, uh, made my top 10 list for this past year in 2022. I just I thought the atmosphere in that book was out, off the charts. Oh, yeah. And, um, that's yeah. where she won me over big time. Like I liked Wizard of Earth. Oh, interesting. I, yeah. So, that, so Wizard got you started, but Tombs of Adewan clinched the it. deal. That was okay. it. And then I started just and then I started reading her essays. Right. And uh, actually, Philip Chase, who I just uh, put up a little bit earlier, he also has a channel and and he's very well read. And he uh, he got me started on her essays. And I've watched a lot of okay. videos about this. I've watched yours as well. And uh, I think she's just brilliant. And then I read her book, yeah. uh, Steering the Craft on Writing. And okay. Yeah. Yeah. It has helped me tremendously in reviewing books and, and, and kind of dissecting them. And uh, one of the things I like about your, your videos is I like that you read other people's reviews. Like I was watching the okay. second apocalypse, the Prince of nothing stuff, because that's yeah. how I found you. That was the first thing I saw of yours. And you read like a five-star review and then you read a one, I think you read like a more <laughs> negative review. And I mean, the negative review of course just slammed him because obviously the books are, not for everybody as no books are, but yeah. Um, People have very strong opinions about backer, don't they? <laughs> yeah. How do you, I mean, how do you feel? Because he is someone who's into philosophy and I know that even in his philosophy rubs some people the wrong way. Like, Oh, what, you mean your, like the, the, I think it's called the three pound brain, that, that sort of stuff. The bicameral mind. Yes. Yeah, the yeah. fact that 
people. I mean, were, I've read, I haven't, I can't say that I read a ton of his philosophical essays. Um, I've enjoyed reading them. I mean, just sort of like when I'm reading Descartes or Kant, you know, I, I enjoy reading them. They're well written. There's a lot of interesting thought there. I don't buy it a lot of the time, <laughs> but but I don't have to. Um, hmm. And then, um, I mean, I like, I, I really do like his. I haven't read anything other than the second apocalypse. So I haven't read um, some of the other um, novels that he's written that are or standalone, but the second apocalypse is really incredible in scope. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I do hope that he continues the series because where it ended is so, I mean, you want to talk about a gut punch jaw dropper. Yeah. You're like, wait, yeah. where's the rest of the book? <laughs> like what, what, it stops here what <laughs> like oh, well wow. and and what's happening to the world you know yeah i mean and also i don't know about you but like when i finished second apocalypse i was like there was no other way this could end like if this is the end like this would make sense i think because yeah all, all i mean he, he committed matter. to writing some more stuff but i, I don't know that he's actually going to do it yeah, so he's went off the the grid quite a bit, yeah. and his brother has been uh, kind of his communicator in in, in some ways. Okay. And, and this is this is fresh off the press here, but like this past week, uh, I think it's uh, actually they're in the comments. Uh, commenter Red Viper Twenty One, I think that's their name, uh, just linked me to it, and it's his brother has been uploading Second Apocalypse content to YouTube, and one of them was you know highlighting the fact that. You know, new stuff or, or, or old, old interviews oh, okay. insights okay um you know he, apparently he was pretty in tune with his brother on his writing and hmm. one of the things he uploaded was that he has to write the no god duology that's supposed to follow oh wow the aspect number so this is like the first time we've heard <laughs> rumblings in a long long time not saying it's gonna happen but i'm hope i'm hopeful that would be really awesome i mean it could get it could just make a worse world, of course. <laughs> you more could. suffering, more more uh, despair, and stuff like that. So, uh, why do we like it's killed? You know. Yeah. Why do we like this series? Like, it, and it is hard to justify sometimes. Part of um, it is the characters, right? The, char the characters are so incredibly compelling. Um, whether it's uh, Knaus, you know, or um, Akamian. I, I always mispronounce their names too. Yeah, it's um, fine. They're so difficult. <laughs> you know, Calhus himself, um, Esme, um, they're, they're really well done. And so, you know, sort of like Martin, he's also not afraid to like develop a character fully and then just like snuff them out, you know? Yeah. No one's safe at all in that yeah. world. That, you know there's there is this trend of like darker fantasy right um yeah, glenn yeah. cook in the 80s with the black company was a lot darker of a tone than most people had been you know familiar well, with but you, but you had already carl edward wagner you know yeah um, that's true he, he's kind of leading the way on that i'd say yeah and thomas covenant was also extraordinarily dark for, i guess yeah could can you call that dark fantasy i would say um, it's anti-hero for sure mm -hmm. um what do you think the appeal is, though? Like, especially it seems like more now than ever before that 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 type of fantasy seems to be more of the mainstream. Well, I think there was there was that reaction against the sort of like with Westerns, the white hats versus the black hats kind of thing. You can mm -hmm. figure out who everybody is. I mean, George R. R. Martin sometimes gets gets uh, dinged interestingly in cultural politics because they'll like put him up against Tolkien and they'll be like, you know, with Tolkien and these are all like, you know, trad people. Uh, <laughs> you know who the good guys are and the bad guys and there's a story and George R. R. Martin is just nihilistic, you know, everybody's gray and, and that's not the case at all, you know. Um, in Song of Ice and Fire, uh, clearly there are some characters who are, are good guys. It's just that they're not like totally good guys. And, and there are redemption arcs like Jamie Lannister, as opposed to in the show where he's kind of just a putz uh, who can't get <laughs> away from his sister. In, in the, the books by, by book five, he is like on a major redemption arc and is uh, opposed to his, his sister, wants to fix things. Um, but there's, you know, there's that kind of... Um, complexity to yeah. to the characters that's quite important um and that might be something that people find attractive i think there's probably also some people who just love you know mayhem and torture and 
you know um the spectacle of it yeah exactly i mean thinking about the second apocalypse right so if we're if we're thinking about those let's say um the you know the 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 aspect emperor series and particularly from like book three onward the battles are so friggin bloody right and people yeah. are just dying left and right and unfortunately a lot of the shrunk are dying too but and then they start eating the shrunk you know, yeah, and, and getting like... getting getting all messed up and in in their heads um uh, you know it, at a certain point for readers like me you're like oh come on one more of these you know uh, <laughs> yeah. but but backer manages to pull it off and, and it yeah. reminds me kind of I, I quit watching james bond movies uh i was watching one back and this is like uh 12 years ago 13 years ago and the fight scene was like taken forever and i was like i can't watch any more of this crap you know uh, somebody should have died by by now, or I mean, one one of the main fighters, because everybody else is dying around them, you know, uh, as as people who don't have plot armor. This is just ridiculous, you know. And yeah. there's a risk of that happening with backers' massive battle scenes, but it doesn't happen somehow. You know, yeah. you, you're not like oh, I've I've had it with this crap, you know. Yeah, I'm sure there are people who have had that reaction i did not yeah i yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I felt like the whole thing was almost biblical i mean and and mm. uh, you know what i mean like even in the in the prose and the way that it was written and that is something i think that he kind of um cherry picked from mccarthy because cormac mccarthy writes very biblically okay. in in his more dense work. <laughs> i see yeah. one of one of your, your uh commenters says there's probably quantum of solace that that sounds about right you know if there was <laughs> if there was one thing where like somebody was like i think like climbing up a tower and like basically parkouring it you know, at that point i was like ah this is bullshit i'm done with this I, you know i need to see some actual plot yes yeah and there is such a thing as overstaying your welcome i mean there, there's definitely yeah, that and yeah. it, it's interesting to see people try to replicate things that like for instance george r, r. martin has done mm. i said oh well he kills characters off and then they try to like repeat that like because like that that's what sells and they totally miss the point of it um the reason yeah. why we feel something when these characters eyes not that it's unexpected that is a part of it there is absolutely a shock factor to it but it's the inner conflict of the character and that the actual the morality is not this character versus this character it's this character versus themselves and it yeah. creates a longing to wanting to see if that person actually could end up being better and oh, martin interesting yeah 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 and i think martin does a great job of showing that there is potential in this with someone like a jamie lannister and yeah. And then we see a character get snuffed down. We say, maybe they had like, in a way it's almost hopeful. You know what I mean? Like it's almost an optimistic way. Like you're kind of embracing the struggle, embracing the contradictions of the person and you're hoping they can get better. And then before they get their chance, they get snuffed out. And it's, it's, yeah. it's heart wrenching stuff. And I think that a lot of times more modern fantasy that's come after has really struggled to capture that magic again. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of like what you're saying about you can take the wrong lesson as an imitator. And, and all, all artists are imitators to a significant extent, right? Yeah. But the, the real question, and here, you know, we could talk in, in terms of uh, philosophy. The real question is like, as you're choosing, what do you select? What do you identify as being the essential thing? You know, and, and to me, that seems like a question of prudence, hmm. you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, same thing happens in music too. Like you, you look at musical trends, uh, something comes in and people are like, oh, this is so amazing. Let's do 10 times more of this. You know? <laughs> and you're like, well, you can't make a song just out of that kind of, uh, thing, you know, mm -hmm. or you yeah. can, it's just going to suck, you know? Yeah. And it's going to feel manufactured. And yeah, when yeah. something starts feeling manufactured, not authentic, that's whenever it's time to pack up and uh, close up shop because you, you lost the spirit of the of the work. Uh, Benjamin oh. C wants to know, what's your favorite metal band? So if you were going to ask me um, when I was in my teens and 20s, it would have been Iron Maiden. But I don't, I don't actually have a favorite metal band at this point. I will say this, that um, almost all the bands that I'm into are what we call classic or traditional metal bands from the 70s and 80s some of whom have never like stopped playing like saxon for example or mm -hmm. raven um 
and I do listen to a few newer bands, but not not quite that much. But and so I could say like, you know, who are my favorite bands if that interests you? And it would be, you know, uh, if I had to, you know, you, you like say, well, what are your top five or what are your top ten or stuff like that? And sometimes they kind of migrate in and out, but there's there's a couple that are always there. Iron Maiden is still in the mix, but Judas Priest, Motorhead, Rat. Dio, yes. Black Sabbath. I was waiting uh, for Dio. Deep Purple, yeah. Um, and then it's it kind of you know kind of migrates a bit. Um, like sometimes people come in. Like I go through periods where I'm like really into listening to Tank, you know. Uh, <laughs> and then sometimes Tank will get replaced by Raven or Girl School or you know. Um, and there's there's some newer bands like Orchid that I really really like. Uh, it's awesome. Gr great doom metal metal band. If it, if you have, any of you are into that sort of thing, I think they've broken up though. Uh, they haven't put out a record for years. Oh no! And don't appear to be touring. So <laughs> they were making. You know, there's this great line about them, and I actually used a similar line in describing Jamie Kennedy's book. Um, so somebody said about Orchid, and it was in one of these metal magazines. They write and produce the songs that Black Sabbath never got around to producing. They sound wow. They they're not like a clone of Black Sabbath, but they've got, you know, the bassist has the Geezer Butler thing down. The hmm. guitarist has the Tony Iommi thing down. The singer is better than Ozzy, um, and then the drummers, you know, the drummers got that nice Bill Ward kind of weird offbeat kind of kind of crawl. And uh, Jamie Kennedy in Dare to Know wrote a Philip K. Dick novel that Philip K. Dick never got to writing. Hmm. Is what the, the way I, I yeah, it. yeah, that's a, that's a great endorsement, too. Like, that's that's, that's a heavy one that, that, yeah. that people have I'm, to I'm hoping that he'll write some more books. <laughs> that's guy, awesome, you know. Well, I'm sure um, after you know the, the glowing review, I'm sure it helped out quite a bit. Um, I might check it out. I might it's, check it out. it's it's really good. Yeah, it's awesome. I uh, I'm a big fan of Ronnie James Dio. I, I uh, oh. La Last in Line is one of my favorite songs. Um, one of the smartest guys in not just the world of heavy metal, but the music business in general. I mean, that's if you, what you look at you, you watch these interviews with him, and you're like, holy shit, this guy. I, you know, I'm not gonna say, oh, he was a philosopher or something like <laughs> that. It was some sort of, but he he was a thinker. And uh, I got to talk with somebody who, as I'll say a kid, he was like 16 years old. He got to like tour with Dio and his band. Wow. And he said that Dio could play every instrument. He could just like walk over there and he'd like, you know, pick up the guitar and he'd be like, I wanted, I want you to do the chord like this, not like what you're doing, you know? And then he'd get behind the drums and he, all he did was sing, but he could do every, every one of them. You That's know? awesome. So, and he had it like in his head, you know, this is the way that the songs should sound. And, and, uh, he was very hands-on. Some people don't like that sort of approach. <laughs> <laughs> it wears out bandmates after a while, you know? Yeah. But he's but, got the vision. He just wants to, you know, act that's on it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah, I, uh... whatever, whatever the musical equivalent of vision is. Yeah. What is, is a vision? It's well, still... vision is for sight, right? Yeah. So, what would be the what would be the oral equivalent of that? I don't know. It's a good question, though. Yeah. I just remember the Holy Diver music video being very fantasy D and D esque. <laughs> I love that. It's pretty cheesy. Too. Oh, it's so cheesy, but I love it. Like I watched it last year. I still I still listen to that song. I still watch the videos. And uh, Dio is just. I feel like he doesn't get enough respect, you know, because he wasn't a mess like a lot of like Ozzy. Oh, know? right. Yeah. Yeah. And he just doesn't get. Unfortunately, that some for some reason, the Kardashian. I like I actually love Ozzy, too. But, you know, it seems like the people who are more of a mess get get more of the highlight in uh, in, in rock music. It's strange. Yeah. That, that, and, and Ozzy is sort of at the antipode. He was lucky that these guys needed a singer. None of them liked him, you know. <laughs> Uh, if you read the biographies, they used to pick on him in school and uh, they were like, oh, this this friggin guy. Right. Um, and, you know, he was like the right sound for those first uh, eight albums, although he didn't sing all the songs on the eighth album. Bill Ward actually sang a few tracks because Ozzy was so drunk he wouldn't show up, you know. Yeah. Um, 
if he was only drunk, that'd have been impressive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you know, Ozzy never, you know, never really contributed to the songwriting process. Um, he was great. You know, the best thing that Ozzy ever did was marry uh, Sharon Arden, um, <laughs> Don Arden's daughter, you know, and she surrounded him with such talent. Yeah, Randy you know? Rose. Who then he, he she screwed over too. Yeah, and Bob Daisley and Don yeah. Airy and, you know. Um, Die of a Madman is still a great album though. Oh, yeah. It's, it, those Those first four albums are really great. The one, the ones with uh, Randy Rhodes and Jake mm -hmm. Ely, you know, so good. Yeah, I still have. I'm not. That. I'm not a huge fan of Zach Wild. Um, Me either. The wow, everything. Yeah, I'm good. You know, we saw him with Black Label Society in concert uh, with uh, Thin Lizzy and Judas Priest, and so it was a really weird concert. This is back like in two, 2012 or so in Reading, Pennsylvania, and. You could tell the crowd was there. Some, you know, like thirty percent of the crowd was there to hear Zach Wild and didn't give a shit about either of the bands. Mm -hmm. uh, and then everybody else was there to hear Thin Lizzy and uh, Judas Priest, probably more Judas Priest, and they weren't that big on on Zach Wild. And so he was the middle uh, person. And it was interesting too because after his set ended, all these people in like the the black label society jackets they just left. They, just left. <laughs> they weren't they weren't there to hear Judas Priest, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know he got up on stage and it was like he was essentially you know shredding and it was you know at a certain point my wife who's you know pretty uh she's much more diplomatic than me she's like this guy's just masturbating with his guitar <laughs> and forcing us to listen to this crap you know and some people like, are into that you know yeah well that's <laughs> right yeah yeah and and um I just, I just couldn't get into it, you know? Yeah. So. I, uh, I, I myself was, I was never a big, big fan. Um, but I, uh, I don't listen to much rock music metal anymore, unfortunately. No, no not really. Did you like drift out of it or what, a little what bit? Happened? I don't listen to a lot of music as much anymore. Um, okay. I listen to a lot of drill rap from Chicago South side, um, okay. because it, it, it's fascinating to me and also kind of sad. And it's also, there's like a raw authentic, like, authentic feel to it yeah, yeah you know what i mean like they're yeah. not the best lyricists but like they're going through real things and they're and they're you know making songs about it you know and, and we have a big wow. and distinctive rap scene here in milwaukee apparently really yeah i don't know that much about it because i don't really my wife knows she's she's much more broad in her interest in okay. music and she's been into rap and hip-hop since she was like in in high school but that's what she assures me about <laughs> it, there's all different types of scenes everywhere yeah crazy. you know i was i was actually in a rap in fayetteville when i was a professor down there and i wish i would have like gotten a uh you know mp3 of it apparently there was a line that had to do because you know i was kind of no nonsense in the classroom and I wasn't being a jerk to the students, but I would, you know, I'd hold them to standards and they were not all that used to that. They didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't know exactly what the expression was, but the idea was that I was like coming down hard on people and, and they were saying, I'm going to come down uh, hard on you like Sadler. You know? <laughs> and then of course, who the hell would know who that is, right? Except in that, that like very small community, <laughs> but somebody brought it to my attention you know, and I wish I would have like gotten a recording of it. Cause <laughs> <laughs> that's an accolade, I think. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, but we talked about works not being, you know, uh, relevant 30 years later, that rap is, you know, <laughs> it's very sp specific. <laughs> I tried doing some like Google searches just in case something would show up back when I still remembered what the words were and nothing ever came up. You that's know? unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch has a question for you. He says, do you read many classics or literary fiction? Uh, yeah, I mean, I read a lot of classics because I teach a lot of them um, or, or write on them. I mean, a lot of the philosophy stuff that I work on would figure into this big, broad thing that we call the classics. And then, you know, because I do work on anger. I'll also read a lot of classic literature that deals with that, like the Odyssey or the Iliad, or, you know, I mentioned the song of Roland. Um, I'm yeah. teaching Frankenstein this semester and uh, that has a lot of interesting stuff about, about anger and revenge in there. 
And literary fiction, um, you mean like stuff that like the critics think that we ought to read? Like Carol like, Bloom and those type of people. Yeah, yeah like Gravity's Rainbow. Yes. Or, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't read a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Interesting. I, I would have I would have thought you did, to be honest. Well, a lot of it is boring and pretentious. <laughs> And, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that about any particular work. And then it, it also gets a lot of like, um, people make too much of this stuff, you know, hmm. or I would rather read speculative fiction that I enjoy or, you know, works that works by people that are classics that I, I know I enjoy as well than read what critics from, you know, the best schools who I know don't know anything more than we do think hmm. that we ought to read or, or that have made their, their way into, you know, but if take, for example, uh, Joyce's Ulysses, right. I mean, I, I started reading that in, in uh, college because everyone was saying, Oh, you got to read this book. And within like 15 pages, I was like, I'm not going to spend the time reading this. I, I don't care about his codes that I'm supposed to figure out. I get that this is a great work of literature, but I got limited time, so I'm going to read other stuff instead, you know, and, and I think that's perfectly fine to do. You don't have to try to read everything. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people out there who like have all sorts of lists of, you know, you must read this or you're not cultured or something. Like that. <laughs> you can do just fine not reading that stuff, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I uh, I have been getting into, you know, uh, more literary fiction and classics. Like, I'm going to read Moby Dick for the first time this year. Yeah, I mean, that's a good one, though. Which, right? which is, oh. yeah, and it's like, if I like it, I'll keep it. So, for instance, I read uh, Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pin Pynchon. Pynchon. Okay. And uh, actually, Tab Williams recommended it to me. And I I got to say, his writing style is, like, really something. Like, it, it's really, it's it's crazy and a very different from anything. It's He's almost like making a mockery of literature in some ways. Mm. Like, I feel like he's like not taking it serious, but still flexing how good he is. But regardless, <laughs> um, I can't say that like I had a great time reading that book. Like I appreciate what it was doing and yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm not sure if I actually got it all. Um, but it's a book that I would never like lie and be like, well, it was really important to me and, and these type of things. But, um, I, th I think that that makes sense. Like to put down the things that aren't compelling to you or aren't speaking to you, especially with limited amount of time, because what usually yeah. happens and this happened to me and it's probably happened to everyone here. At, at, if you've ever dropped out of reading is like you have a lukewarm experience with a book or a bad experience with a book. And you say, I just spent two months of my life. <laughs> like I don't have enough time. I'm not reading. I'll never books. get that time back. Yeah. yeah. Books suck. And then you're done for, for a long time. And, and that sucks. Like we don't want that to happen to people. So I'm a big fan of, reading what you want to read and yeah um what, what's your take because i mean you've been in uh academia your you know your whole life and you've worked with a various amount of people uh there is a certain pretension to say that you know fantasy sci-fi speculative fiction the umbrella of it is not real literature like how, how do you feel about that <laughs> how, what does that what does that do to you um i mean I, I, that's something that um people in speculative fiction have been writing about for quite a long time. Like, you know, Stanislaw Lem has got a whole discussion about that in uh, some of his, his stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, you look at like people like Dick, who is essentially dismissed and, and uh, even, even as like press wouldn't publish his realistic fiction while he was alive. You know, they wanted more and more sci-fi, more, more schlock as they, they viewed it. Um, I mean, the, the, the really good sci-fi and fantasy and stuff like that does the same sort of stuff as the great classics. So mm -hmm. you can put Dick or Le Guin up against Dostoevsky and they come out, per, you know, about equal. Um, and they both read Dostoevsky, you know, so no big yeah. surprise there. Um, and I think a lot of the stuff that is considered to be the must reads of a particular time, give it 50 years and only scholars are going to be reading that, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and it's hard to tell which is going to be which. Right. Um, but, you know, a great example of this is um, in somebody who, who is in that very literate crowd, uh, Philip Roth. I mean, I read some of his stuff back in, in college. It was, you know, very clever and all that. 
nobody's going to read that that stuff 100 years from now you know uh <laughs> any more than they're reading some of the other people who are considered to be really big big deals um and you know i i guess you could say that there's going to be some sci-fi and fantasy that will continue holding up yeah right I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a guy rapping in the, the apartment next next to ours. I cannot. Yeah. Is he good? Well, eh, he's very monotonous. Uh, <laughs> I think he's practicing. You know, I've only, I've heard this like the last two days. Um, See, here's what you do: you take the lyrics and then you put it out first. <laughs> all I hear is like mumbling. He he, he almost right. sounds like somebody doing a. Uh, uh, he almost sounds like an auctioneer in in a way. You know. <laughs> Um, but it's identifiable as that. Any, anyway, back, back to the, that, that question, you know, so like, you know, think about Dick in, uh, I think it's a maze of death. He has a character who is consulting the great, uh, spiritual classics. And so, you know, he reads the Tao Te Ching and he reads the Bible and stuff like that. And included in that is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Hmm. It's in a fictional universe, like, I don't know, 2300, 2400. And it's recognized as being like something that people will benefit from reading. It was Dick who was saying that. Uh, that's kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? It, you know, it really a lot, is. A lot of these great, great works are going to become classics, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and it's it's also interesting because like like i talked about with john williams and stoner just because the it, it's an older work and the author mm -hmm. has passed on doesn't mean that it it will mm -hmm. not eventually catch you know into the um the zeitgeist it, it won't be pushed in in, in mm. into the cycle of of conversation it can happen at any point which is crazy and there's been a lot of authors right who have become famous after their death which is always such a shame yeah um yeah, but, they should get to enjoy some of that money and fame and door recognition. Opening. Yeah. Yeah. The recognition. I mean, for me, uh, honestly, I feel like a second apocalypse and Prince of Nothing. I, I it I understand the content of it is something that is prickly for people. I, I actually mm -hmm. totally understand that. And I always feel weird recommending it. But it does certainly feel like a work that has had so much thought put into it. Oh, and yeah. um, it's so so much more original than a lot of the other stuff that I read that, that was published around that time and now uh, that I always just, I wonder if like it will get a little bit of a, a kick, you know, in the pop culture realm, but maybe the content is just too rough. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's funny. And I, I did talk about this in one of the, cause I did three videos uh, on, on uh, one for each of the, the first books because it, it's so dense that you, you could watch them all. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the critics was like upset about the many references to penises, you know, and I was like, you know, there isn't that many to begin <laughs> with. And, you know, uh, Esme is a prostitute, so there's probably going to be some in there. And, you know, grown up people, um, they do have sex, <laughs> you know, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of, you know, I was like, that's a really weird thing to like single out. Mm -hmm. I guess they thought they're being clever, you know? Yeah. Um, What's something I talk about a lot on here and I've had the conversation with authors and like, you know, why is it that, that, you know, it seems like intimate scenes um, are so much more of a taboo subject, but mm. stabbing a person in the neck is, is totally acceptable. And also from what I can tell from people who write, it seems like writing a romance scene is actually a lot more, they feel like it's more difficult than writing, you know, a scene that it has violence or even a piece of dialogue. It just you like, make, you make yourself more vulnerable in doing that hmm. because, hmm. um, there's always the risk that people are going to think, Oh, you're writing about that. That's your, that's your fetish. That's your sexuality. That's, that's how you view relations between people. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. you, you write a battle scene and they're not going to be like, Oh, you've got such a weird notion about how swords work. <laughs> so, There's somebody out there that will point it. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a um, really good point though. I, I think that that's exactly what it is. It's, it's one of the most vulnerable things and, you know, usually only a select few people know how you feel or how you approach that thing. Um, in your yeah. life 
there were some uh, there were some good um let's say not not particularly pornographic scenes that i've read lately where i think part of what what you want to see in it is like an appreciation for what can happen between people when they're when they're having sex you know the intimacy that can be expressed and developed and i think dan simmons hyperion Cantos were, were good that way. Uh, there was another person who, who, a feminist critic who made fun of him for like not understanding how, you know, sex works. And I, I think that she was totally off base. And then I, again, I've been rereading uh, CJ Chera um, for an upcoming thing. And, you know, she's got sex scenes. She's actually got one character in Rim Runners who um, has sex with a lot of people. She's, you know, the, the, 37 year old female ex marine spacer um and none of it is pornographic it's all and i don't want to like go to the other extreme and say oh it's very tasteful you know <laughs> because i don't think we want uh tasteful that that's its own form of weirdness you want something that to use a term that you used before authentic something that yeah strikes you as somebody who's actually had sex before is like yeah this this is this is the way it works when people actually, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we could say similar things too about like meals, you know, sometimes a character, sometimes a writer will like, you know, have these extremely interesting discussions about cuisine and, you know, we gotta, we gotta be able to make sense of it uh, in terms of our own gustatory experiences. Right. Yeah, definitely. And George R. R. Martin has the food descriptions and feasts down. Uh, people complain about his at length. And I'm like, look at the man. You know, well, he's, yeah, he's a guy who likes to eat. <laughs> he loves to eat. He, you know, half the reason why he lives in uh, New Mexico, Albuquerque, I think is where. No, he's in Santa Fe. Uh, you know, he loves the Mexican food. Uh, it was so funny. He, <laughs> I didn't know that. That's so the, the actress who played Shay in the show went and visited him. And I, I've remarked before on how, like, if you've never seen it, you got it's just watching uh, a nerdy older guy drown and cringe it's it's amazing you oh, gotta watch it um he's like showing her his toys and stuff and he's like isn't this train great shay and she's like ah, I, I got paid to be here and uh he takes her to the i don't know what i'm telling the story uh he takes her to this mexican restaurant and he's like food's great here and you can tell she's just like okay and then like she wants to dance there's a live band and he's like dancing in the booth but he's also trying to eat stuff it's it, it's <laughs> It's a wild <laughs> video that, that someone greenlit. Crazy. Like I don't know how someone was like, "Yeah, this is this is what we need to put a lot." <laughs> that 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 sounds very very funny. Legendary. It's yeah. absolutely legendary. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that there's definitely like a truth, I guess, and maybe um, or a sense of truth to a scene that involves any of the senses or the how about the uh, the pleasures of life, whether it be eating or sexual or whatever it might be. Yeah, you know, somebody who's good at talking about music, for example, is uh, Zelazny. Yes. You see that coming up over and over again in, in his, not just in the Amber stuff, where some of the characters are quite good musicians, but um, much of his other fiction as well. Yeah, and Lord of Light was also, just mentioned right, Zelazny, right, man, yeah. what, a book, what a book that is. Um, yeah. Whew kind of kind of his uh the one that gets mentioned the most i actually find that more people have read lord of light than the books of amber which is crazy to me because mm. the books of amber are so short and like fun and and quickly paced like i feel like they still yeah. appeal to a modern audience but um it seems like less people i i think them. they hold up um i reread uh in order to prepare for doing a worlds of speculative fiction the uh book six through ten um back when i had covid um in april and early may and i really enjoyed them and, and you know when you have covid uh dif different people it affects different ways but you can't concentrate quite as much you know yeah and they were still quite readable i actually you know total trivia i also watched my way through this this awesome british sci-fi series if you haven't ever seen it you, you got to check it out it's called blake seven and it's very dark. It was uh, late 70s, early 80s. And the BBC did it, but they gave him like zero money to work with. So <laughs> the sci-fi effects are terrible. The uh, costumes sometimes don't work right, you know. But the acting is good and the writing was really good. And, and they... <laughs> 
They also, you know, they didn't do the typical, I mean, you think about the other sci-fi shows that were coming out at the same time, Battlestar Galactica, Buck Rogers, you know, where everything is wrapped up neatly in, you know, one or two episodes and they, they all laugh at the end. Blake seven is not like that at all. You know, it's, it's very dark and it's, uh, it's got compelling characters, <clears throat> you know, um, it's quite quite well done, and so I you know I watched my way through that, and that was that was quite enjoyable too. Yeah, I uh, I, I looked it up real quick, and it has pretty good reviews, and still it's got people... a cult following. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll check it out. I'm always down. I uh, I haven't watched a lot of the older sci-fi stuff. You know, even okay. uh, some of the original Twilight Zone. Like I haven't seen enough of that, Ooh, and yeah. I feel like I feel like I'm gaining a more of an appreciation for that, and then. Maybe it's the fact that I'm also reading a little bit more sci-fi now. It's it's definitely kicking me in, into that gear. Um, have you watched Black Mirror? Yeah, we watched our way through it a couple of years ago. It was me and and my wife and my kids, and uh, we went on like a marathon with it. Um, and it's it's pretty good, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the episodes I think are better than others. Um, which is bound to happen, right? With yeah. that episodic kind of kind of feel to it. I, I was curious what your yeah. thoughts on it were because that seems like it was like pretty pretty popular, like for the pop culture. Oh, right. Like a yeah, lot of people yeah. were sharing and saying, "This is so it. true." Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's a really good example of like you know sci-fi or fantasy speculative fiction like actually being applicable and 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 it's very interesting much though. If you were to ask people, so how long has it been since? The last episode aired like maybe three years or so. I would say off the top of my head. If you were to go down the street and ask people and you'd be like, what was your favorite episode of Black Mirror? I bet a lot of people who have watched it would be like, yeah, I don't know. I can't really remember that much of it. I could see that. I could see yeah. that. Um, I know. I feel like everyone always told me to watch, but no one ever told me episodes to watch. So, I mean, maybe that kind of coincides with what, what your point is. Like I would, I would get yeah. recommended a lot, but no one would ever tell me the episode to watch. Um, whereas twilight well, zone, I know that there are actual episodes. People are like, you got to watch this. Yeah. One. I think a lot of the discourse around black mirror was people saying, Ooh, this thing that we're seeing here, this is like this black mirror episode. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's 100% right. And so, makes it very shareable on social media, which, right, you know. Right. Yeah, definitely. but there's an ephemerality to that now, you know? Yeah, there so. absolutely is. Um, someone brought this up, and yeah. this is an author I really wanted to. Um, oh, yeah, up, yeah. China Mavell. And we were, you were talking about. Is that how it's pronounced? I, I, I'm always, I I'm always a little here. leary about, you know, because I I, 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 I typically mispronounce people's names. Mievel, maybe China Mievel. I, I honestly. I, just, I've said Mievel, but I know that can't be right. <laughs> we'll just call him CM. Exactly. What is, what is calm CM? Yeah. Uh, I read Perdido Street Station last year, and I thought it was exquisite. Like I thought it was such yeah. a a tangible book in the in the sense that I could like feel the film of dirt on me when I walked into uh, New Crow's Bazaar or however you say it. And I don't know, the writing was beautiful, just so yeah. good. Yeah, he's 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 really quite amazing. Um, there's the scar, and wasn't there another one in that particular? Iron Council, but, Scar, yeah, and Perdido right. Street Station. Yeah, I've only yeah, read and, and, and and I think who who did say that? Um, some Oki dude. Yeah, I, I think remembering it, um, the sex scenes were well done. I'd say. I mean, I thought that whole book was well done. I mean, it was just yeah. such a, a chaotic uh, whirlwind of things, and you know, one thing that I've heard a uh, criticism of fantasy is that. It, it, it doesn't have enough ideas. I've heard a lot of people say, I go to sci-fi when I want ideas. And I understand what they're saying about that. Like, I get that. But I do think that, like, someone like Chano Mivel and, like, Perdido Street Station has, like, quite a bit of ideas. And maybe not, like, up and center, like, this is what I'm saying. But, like, yeah, you know what I mean? I mean, even in... Because, you know, with... with, with... Maville stuff you got spies and scholars and people like that it's easy for them to have ideas right and then you've also got like you know political organization going on with the the raft community and stuff um but even with people who are writing more straightforward less ornate work there's a lot of ideas there i mean again think about you know the world of earthsea and all the yeah cosmology that's going on in there too 
Um, somebody says Clive Barker, you know, has yeah. great ideas. And, and we could talk about horror too. You know, does horror have a lot of ideas? I think so. It, it probably depends, right? There's the, there's like the low grade, not particularly good sci-fi and horror and um, fantasy, which might be people just writing to make, make a living back in the day or nowadays, like essentially yeah. doing fan fiction or they're, fi like they're filling a market, right? Uh, exactly, Tad, yeah. Tad talked about, they said, someone's always going to buy a book with a dragon on it. <laughs> like there is an audience that says, is I that true? Think, yeah, that's what he said. He said there, because <laughs> I was asking yeah. him kind of the same question. I need you. to put dragons on my philosophy books. Then. Well, yeah. you, you just hit the million dollar idea. You're <laughs> once Nietzsche on a dragon. That's, that's what they really exactly. want. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I can make a whole series, right? You just get like, Plato hitting a stone cold stunner on big old Smile. Fat David Hume on a, on a dragon <laughs> who's like laboring with him, you know, and then <laughs> pour a little Spinoza on, you know, maybe a little dragon or. <laughs> uh, see, <laughs> that's it. You got it. Nietzsche, Nietzsche going to the pharmacy to get his medicine with, with another dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, but you know, maybe those, the ones who are writing for, um, specifically that market, uh, maybe they don't have as many ideas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments and I think that if we're talking about, um, the kinds of ideas, obviously we're not going to get like a ton of ideas about like technology and its effects on us in fantasy. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, like Tolkien, you know, he's, he's worried about something like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but we are going to get a lot of things having to do with metaphysics. Think about Amber and, yeah. you know, trying to explain the relation between Amber and chaos and shadow and all that or moral themes, you know, that, that, that's important as well. And, and I think you can develop that stuff just as well in fantasy or horror as you can in sci-fi. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I definitely agree with that. Uh, the series I, I just started was, uh, the green bone saga by Fonda Lee, who's another Canadian author actually. And, uh, the whole idea is that they have this mineral of jade and jade is this resource that some people can ingest and it gives them enhanced abilities. Oh, okay. And, and as you can imagine, Jade is kind of a source of like, you want to kind of hog that resource, you know, mm -hmm. like in the world, like oil, uh, that kind of thing. So it, it plays out in, in this international way where it's like, well, these people over here, are they going to be able to import it? Um, mm -hmm. But they can't even use Jade. So, you know, there's a lot of power dynamics to that and, and how it's kind of siphoned off and, and abused in a lot of ways to keep uh, some people in poverty or to keep them in, you know, um, a, almost like a dark age kind of okay approach. Yeah. Um, now it hasn't gotten to that point in that series yet, but I think that's where it's going. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I also think of like Lord of light, right? Like Lord of light. There's mm -hmm. that. Um, at least I hope I'm remembering the right portion where like, there's a whole, they're like barbarians almost completely. They don't have any of the technology, but these people do. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think power dynamics get explored really well in fantasy. Yeah, that's 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 quite true. I mean, it depends on who's doing the writing, right? Um, yeah, but yeah, the spice <laughs> must flow. That's a really good. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the originals, right? Dune did it did it very very well. Yeah, it's, and there's debates about whether the Dune series should be considered science fiction or or rather mm -hmm. science fantasy, right? Because the stuff that the characters do is so you know. Yeah. So uh, incredible. Um, I mean, it is science fiction in that it's in space, but, you know. It, it, you know, it's easy to think. Like, I think at the beginning of a conversation, if you say someone says, make the distinction between sci-fi and fantasy, I think people who are really extreme and on one end and hate the other can, like, make their cases. And I think it, you could be like, oh, that's actually, like, a pretty good point. But then you start seeing someone like uh, Roger Zelazny and they, yeah. and, or Dune, and then things start getting very muddy very quickly. And it's about impossible i think to make a true distinction like there's too many things that are in the middle yeah and then and that's one of the it's great that we do have this umbrella term of speculative fiction so mm -hmm. we can include these like massive genres like horror and and sci-fi and fantasy and alternate history uh and then throw other stuff in there that doesn't fit nicely like weird what counts as weird yeah. you know, where the boundaries is is it horror yeah something can be horror and weird at the same time um 
So I, I think I think speculative fiction is, I, I, you know, once I discovered that there was such a term, I was like, oh, this is perfect. This this actually uh, encompasses all the stuff. I mean, including like say another one of my my favorite authors, Jorge Luis Borges, you know, um, who's playing around with lots and lots of philosophy in his short stories, you know. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is a wide umbrella. And uh, for me, the weirder, the better. I like things that that oh, yeah? all of these things. Um, you know, actually, I think George R. R. Martin does a really nice job in Feast for Crows. I think that it gets borderline horrific, you know, Lady Stoneheart and these type of things. Like he actually does a very yeah. nice job. And some of the lore is very Lovecraftian as well. He was a big fan and it's pretty evident. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if he'll mix sci-fi in there somehow. <laughs> Well, he's he's a triple threat. I mean, he has written horror and he has I written find. fantasy and he has written science fiction and not just like dabbled, but you know, he's he's done all three. Yeah. Um I mean, it's interesting because uh um uh, Dan Simmons, um mm -hmm. you know, I I've read him mainly for his his sci-fi stuff, but he, most of his stuff isn't sci-fi, it's horror. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, and uh, he, he, yeah, he's written a lot, and, and you know, but George Martin. Also, thinking about this though, like he's known for his fantasy, but he's written way more sci-fi, like Dying of the Light. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones that I'm blanking on now, of course. Uh, but he also wrote Fever Dream, which I absolutely adore. It's my favorite vampire story. I actually think it's phenomenal. Um, okay, different Not take on him. Oh, you, it, it's really it's something. It's like 17 or 1800s, like tugboat going down the Mississippi in the New Orleans swamps. I mean, it is different mm. and the way the vampires are are also very different and the way okay. that they like survive it's i love it i i actually think it'd make a great movie as well um and it deals with some pretty heavy stuff because in that time period obviously um you know it wasn't ideal in america on equal rights and it, it, it's definitely a piece of the story and it's it's pretty heavy uh, george has a way of like getting to those emotions in every story mm. he writes he actually in dying of the light it's a very short story um, it's only like 180 pages, but he actually kind of tackles nihilism in a way. Okay. Where they're at a planet and like there was different like sections of the planet. And one of the sections of the planet was all based on nihilism. And Ooh. there's a gentleman who had his heart broken. He's kind of standing on the edge and like, he has this really like amazing, like, you know, enlightenment while he's okay. there. And the wind is a, uh, the wind is a song and the song like, encourages people to kill themselves i mean it's it, it, it's a it's a wild story man and yeah. the, the way he built out that planet and the universe around it like the actual universe in 180 pages is is nothing short of impressive so um, yeah if everyone is listening i really recommend dying at the light i really liked it and it'll only take you a, a fourth of the time it'll take you to read game of thrones so. <laughs> Well, and then, you know, the problem with uh, Song of Ice and Fire is that he may never finish it, you know? Yeah. So do you, I mean, it's it was one thing to start reading from Game of Thrones onward mm -hmm. and really get into it and, and all of that. I don't know that a lot of people in the present would be like, yeah, I should I should read this unfinished series that has all these threads that are probably yeah. not going to be wrapped up, you know? I think so. I, I run a, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast as well. Okay. Um, and it's it's my favorite. As you can tell, I have the shirt on. I got a picture of Robert Baratheon back here. Paint. Uh, it's it's my jam. Um, <laughs> and what I have found is and, and the difference between something like this and something that, you know, maybe just a random series that wouldn't be finished is if it wasn't what it was for the genre. I would say it would be a bigger deal that it's not finished, but okay. it is without a doubt one of the most impactful works since Tolkien, yeah. if, if, if not the most. Right. So I think especially that third book, like it is such a monumental piece of fantasy that people want to see what it was about yeah, and yeah. then join in on being depressed. That it'll never be finished because, <laughs> you know, we're all waiting at this point. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's what I think that's what mm -hmm. keeps present day readers engaged. Um, but that changes once it is for sure not getting finished. Right. Like once that happens, dies, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th I don't know what happens then. I do feel confident in the, in its reputation. It'll always have the asterisks next to it, but I think it's such an important series. Um, and the conversation that it does have with the history of the genre is also really important as well. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know if him dying sort of like remove. I mean, it, it it puts things at a final status, right? But yeah, unless they have someone finish it, like Wheel of Time, like Robert Jordan. I, I, I don't, I don't think that'd be a good idea. I agree. Know? I agree with you. I mean, you look at um, most of these. This is a whole different topic, and I, I don't want to mm -hmm. go too deep into this because I'm going to have to get going soon. Yeah, it's fine. Um, but you look at a lot of these continuance um, attempts, right? So, like, you think about uh, the Dune series Ugh. and Herbert's son taking it over and just, like, churning out books and stuff like that. And, you know, they're not – they're just not as good, you know, and – there are some authors who deliberately recruited people to work with them and then they could farm it off to them. Anne McCaffrey was kind of in that, that realm, you know, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, I have a hard time thinking of somebody who's going to do a good job with Martin's world, you know? I mean, yeah. I, su I suppose though, maybe it's sort of like how bands you know, who are going to, they're losing like an important person from their band. And then they go to, you know, they find somebody in a, uh, um, what do you call those bands where they, they imitate the band, uh, not parody uh, band, the cover band, not a cover band, but a, uh, tribute band. Okay. Tribute. Right. Yeah. So you get, um, you get, so like, you know, Judas Priest, Tim Ripper Owens was in a Judas Priest cover band. Right. Um, I think the same thing for Iron Maiden when Blaze Blazely came in. Uh, so maybe you could get somebody who writes really, really good fanfic, you know, <laughs> and get them in there. I mean, who you knows? know, like a fanfic that's really, really close in tone and sensibility to the original author. Uh, maybe. maybe they would make an okay continuer, but maybe they're not going to have the, you know, vision to do. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things where the people I would I would choose, uh, or the people who I think would fit, because uh, there are a few. Uh, they've mm -hmm. all publicly said they don't want to do it, <laughs> and so that yeah, to me, yeah. I'm like, unless if George has somebody, which I don't think he he will. Um, who knows? But yeah, but it'll always remain, I think, a very important piece of the genre. Um, and, I think you're right. Yeah, and it, it'll yeah. be hard for me ever to top the feelings I had the first time reading through that series. I mean, I've just I've been chasing that high ever since, and I haven't got there yet. <laughs> uh, Second Apocalypse is pretty damn close, though. I, I will say that, and uh, you know, Realm of the Elderlings and Malaz, and those are the the okay. giants in my head. Um, but it's been nice because I went back and read a lot of the inspiration. So Jack Vance's Dying Earth, Roger Zelazny, yeah. and then Tad Williams, who's another one of my favorites. You know, so. Yeah, there's always there's always new tunnels to go down, right? There's there's never an end to this stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I brought him up earlier. I don't know if you've if you've read him, uh, Carl Edward Wagner. You know, for the the Kane series, I think you can say that he's he's somebody who's inspiring George R. R. Martin and um, R. Scott Backer. You know, yeah, um, I I haven't read him yet, but he's on my list. You're gonna. You're probably gonna enjoy it. I won't. I won't make an absolute prediction. But, you know, <laughs> I'll let you know. He's one of the first, like, really great, well-developed um, antiheroes in I'd fantasy. Yeah, yeah, and I'm always down about going back down that rabbit hole and seeing who inspired who. That's like one of my favorite things to do now. Yeah, I will absolutely check it out. I uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your Friday night, so I, I am. I'll I'll. Uh, wrap this thing up here, but I wanted to thank you so much uh, oh, for coming on. You're very welcome. And I've, I've really enjoyed this. So um, yeah, we'll do it again. Uh, and Hey, yeah, maybe yeah. if uh, I read some of these uh, recommendations, I'll bring you on and we can chat about the books or vice versa or whatever, man. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. And you should reach out to James Kennedy. I know? should. Uh, he might be somebody interesting. Yeah, I uh, I actually added that to my Amazon cart, so it's oh uh, good. It, it'll it'll. I have a problem. I can't stop buying books. <laughs> uh, but let people know where they can find you at on the internet. I do have oh. uh, your channel listed down in the description below. People go make sure to subscribe. But uh, where else can they find you? Well, I write on Medium, um, and it's pretty easy to find me there. Just you know, type in Gregory Sadler Medium, and it'll pop right up. Um, 
I have a podcast, which I, I make from the video lectures, just called Sadler's Lectures, also easy to find just by typing in. Um, you know, if people want to know about like my academic writings, I'm on academia.edu and I'm slowly shifting things over to fill papers as well. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, it's, I, I'm kind of blessed. It's so easy just to type in Gregory Sadler into Google and like tons You're and tons everywhere. of stuff show up. Yeah. Um, now it's hell for the other 20 or so Gregory Sadlers out there who are trying to like run a business or you know, political campaign or, you know, there's a drummer and there's a photographer <laughs> right? and all of their stuff gets pushed way the hell down. But well, they just the got to do better. Exactly. <laughs> That's all I can tell them. They just got to work harder because you do it all, man. <laughs> you really do. It's impressive. Some, some of them probably deserve to go down in, <laughs> in the, the rankings too. Like there's a, uh, an obnoxious libertarian candidate, I think down in Oklahoma or Texas, who is, who's uh, Gregory Sadler or Greg Sadler. And, Soiling you know, the name. <laughs> well, I mean, we all share the name, right? So, yeah. <laughs> that is so I mean, it could be worse. I could have been like John Smith or something. But... Yeah, that would have been a lot harder to etch out your territory on the internet. That's for damn you know, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll add before we go. So my oldest child, uh, name is Kat Sadler and um, Kat is an actress and is just, you know, like she's in school has done uh, one play with a reading and stuff like that. Unfortunately, there has been for like 10 years or maybe even longer, a Kat Sadler with C-A-T-T -T, who is some sort of celebrity. Oh. And so, you know, uh, it's really hard for her to break it my my uh my kid to uh mm. you know get get up there in the rankings because this other person i mean i'm sort of like internet famous you could say this person's like legitimately famous so <laughs> well maybe they'll make some like mistakes and you know the right the letter gets sent to her and then opens up a door who knows oh that could be cool yeah yeah, yeah. that's happened before yeah um, the WWE famously signed the wrong twin girl wrestlers once. They, really? They're supposed to sign a set of girl wrestlers. There was two sets of them, and they signed the wrong one. <laughs> and now they have a show on E. So that's crazy. And they're awesome. millionaires. Isn't that wild? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for your oh, two thanks hours. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. I would love to do it again and reprise the conversation. Uh, Sounds folks, great. Yeah. Yeah, we, we will absolutely do it again. Uh, folks, go check out uh dr gregory sadler's channel it is fantastic you'll learn a lot and i know a lot of you like the long form content like this and he's got some of the best long form um discussions over uh the books that we love so i would love thanks. for y'all to check that out absolutely man and chat thanks for being here on a friday night i always appreciate you and until we see you next time be good be safe and remember to always keep turning the page all right <laughs>